All right, are we live? Are we live? Is it working? Yeah, it should be. Yeah, it should be. I'm actually gonna open. Are we live? I'm actually gonna open our stream in the um in the thing. Just to, yeah, we're definitely live, and I'm gonna see if I'll probably be looking at the if we can see ourselves in 30 FPS. Yeah, uh, we look good. We look good. And I'm nice, gonna, I'm gonna, nice, nice. I'm gonna look at the chat on um. Because the StreamYard one has like a delay. Actually, no, wait. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Cool. Cool. We are live. So uh, we didn't we didn't actually prepare for the intro. So it's going to be like a very messy stream. Just like the whole podcast is basically is going to be one messy rambling. Um, if it works, if, if, it, if it's working fine, be sure to let us know in the chat. If it's not working fine, Tell us that I'm retarded. Don't don't say Lewis that he's retarded. Lewis is not retarded, but I'm a beast. Tell me retarded is not working properly. Um, the idea of this podcast. Well, we were basically, I was thinking, I'm not going to implicate Lewis on this because he's a pure-hearted man, but I was thinking, you know, we're in Dyer's Discord. We talk, we have a lot of stuff, and I noticed that whenever we chat, there's a lot of people listening. And I thought, hmm, I should monetize this. I should make money off of this. So we made, <laughs> came up with this. <laughs> basically, yeah, I'm a, I'm a greedy, greedy Roman Anatolian uh, with zero uh, Semitic admixture. So that's basically what I came up with. And <laughs> jokes aside, it's based. This podcast basically, it's not going to be a political one. It's not going to be like white guys ads. Political climate, even though some episodes might be, I don't know, uh, some episodes might be theology, some episodes might be about life, some might be about other random stuff. It really depends on what our uh, dopamine levels are. So that's the basic idea. <laughs> uh, no, there's no prop structure. We will be looking at the chat though. So um, if you have anything interesting to comment or if you want to ask something and if it's interesting we will highlight it here we will ridicule you we will make fun of you and then we will take serious answer your query so that's kind of like <laughs> basic idea that i had uh i mean this introduction alone should already give you a good idea like what a mess this is gonna be but that's the beauty of it uh organized chaos so i am the guy that owns the panel and lewis is the guy who holds me captive in this basement Hello, Louis. Say hello to everyone here. Hi, everyone. David is, um, yeah, oh. I gave him his lunch today in my basement and he was pretty happy about it. So. Yeah, like at first he gave me, um, he gave me like some food that I can't even describe. I have food to eat probably. So I said, Louis, give me pizza. Then he gave me pineapple pizza. And then I said that he's stupid. And he removed the pineapple. So thank you, Lewis, for giving me good food so I can provide some sauce. As you can see, I had a gun because of Lewis' food. Um, that's really all that I have. What up, brother, says JP. I'm just testing out, like, the thingamajig in here. It's going to be basically, like, the messiest episode. But over time, it'll be more fun. It'll be more great. Um, actually, I'll, I'm, I'm going to ask this to you, Lewis. Have you played Last of Us 2? <laughs> Let's uh, start with that. That's the that's that I I want to talk about that. Uh no, I haven't played it and I don't think I will. Um yeah, I I didn't play the original. Um I'm not I don't usually play a lot of those kinds of games. Like I tend to play games that have kind of a never-ending aspect to it like MMOs and stuff. Um so I never really played those games, but I have friends and they were making fun of it the whole time and i i just see all the stuff in our discord channel um and there's some pretty uh humorous pretty unpleasant things going on in there i mean i don't know it's like it's like they learn nothing from gamergate i mean i, I don't understand people don't want that shit. yeah it's um i'm someone did you play the first last of us or did you not play that either like I said, I I've ne I don't usually sink money into the games that I'm gonna play for like maybe a few months and then not play again. So yeah. 
Michael says Michael follows up. Uh, whoever wrote the script for The Last of Us needs to be fired and beaten. Yeah, uh, his name is I think Neil Cuckman. Um, he is he has really done a great job uh, on giving an example of a game that's absolute dog shit. So thank you, Cuckman. <laughs> yeah, uh, I played the I played the first game. I played the original. I got it as a birthday gift. Um, I want to say five, six, five, six years ago. I don't remember exactly. I liked the first game. The gameplay didn't really. It wasn't the best part, but the overall atmosphere and all that stuff was really good. And like the latter part of the game was great. It was well done. And when I first saw like the whole lesbian stuff in Last of Us Two. That's when I said, "Yeah, this game is like gonna be terrible." Because every time you insert that stuff, anyone willing to insert that stuff in their games have no idea about anything. They're stupid people, and you should not listen to them. And this game is great proof of that. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna spoil the game because fuck this game. Uh, Neil dies. Uh, not Neil. Not Neil. Uh, uh, Joel dies. Two yards. Two yards. And <laughs> it's not worth playing. Like the main character, the literal main character in the first game, the great the great man dies and well and i've heard this is what i've heard i'm not 100 in on this but apparently he dies meanwhile ellie the character second game and my character of the first game is doing having like lesbian love and joel is like dying while that's happening it's like what the who the fuck wrote this <laughs> sorry for like the reddit word but seriously like who made this and I, Emil said I'm a bit low. Is that I hope this is better. I've moved my mic a bit close to my face, but yeah, I've I've seen the the scene <laughs> to put it that way. You know, the weed and the ah. Did you see the girl? Uh, the girl she's in love with as well. <laughs> like, like, man, yeah, I, I seen her, yeah. <laughs> but one thing I liked about The Last of Us because I did watch some gameplay of the first movie. I thought it was a really uh, kind of original take on um, zombie, like a zombie theme, because it wasn't just like, you know, people, you know, rise from the dead or people bite you and you get infected. And yeah, it is a, it is a virus, but it's not real. It's, it's not well, it's an infection, but it's not a virus. It's uh, it's a fungus. And what's cool about it is that the, the idea is based off of an actual real fungus in nature. I don't know if you know about this, but there's a fungus in nature called the cordyceps fungus which um basically gets infects insects like ants usually or things like that and then it literally mind controls them like they literally get mind controlled and it will make them walk up like as high as they can and then when they get to the highest spot they can on the metabolism they have they just die and then the fungus just starts growing out of <laughs> out of their body or out of their head or whatever and then it spreads the spores um and yeah like i i've always thought you know when i first saw that i was like man imagine if imagine if humans were susceptible to that so yeah i thought the last the original last of us uh series was really good yeah yeah i i i remember hearing about that that blew my mind when i first heard like they actually it is actually based on, on a real stuff. like you look at the first last of us it's detailed it's it has everything like the gameplay has issues I'm not gonna go too much in because I don't think people care about it at this stage. But you look at the second game and you look at like the story is basically what killed it for people because the gameplay is basically the same thing. It's ba it's basically the same gameplay. There's nothing different. And I'm right. Shooters is that if it's not on keyboard and mouse, it's bad. That's my kind of gripe with it. I can't play. I don't think shooters are meant to be played with. Um, PlayStation controls just like how football games are not meant to be played with keyboard and mouse. It just doesn't make any sense. Uh, there's a lot I could say about the game. You cut out huh? What games? What, what games can't be played on keyboard and mouse? Soccer, you know, sports games like oh, yeah. NBA, 2K, PS. Yeah, like yeah. I try it and it doesn't make any sense. But it's it's fit for you know gamepad, like fighting games, right? You're not gonna play fighting games with a keyboard. You're gonna play them with a gamepad. Uh, that's kind of like my main gripe with shooters. And in regards to Last of Us 2, well, Last of Us 2, I think the ending, and like what they try to do is kind of cute. It's like they're trying to give this message that revenge is bad. 
And but the, but here's the problem with the whole revenge is bad I'd end ending idea. And I want to move on because I don't want to talk about Last of Us two anymore. But yeah, the whole bad thing about the revenge is bad thing uh, idea in many of these shooter games or the games where you kill a lot of people is that it really does not make any sense because you get to the main villain and you kill 56 people that had nothing to do with it. They're just guards and they're just like random innocent people. Not random innocent people, but like they're not they're not villains, right? And you kill all those people. You get to the villain. And then you're like, if I killed you, I'm as bad as you. I mean, okay, you literally killed 50, 60 people and you got to the main villain and you're going to let the main villain go so you can hire more people so you can kill more of them. But you're not, you're not like him. Yeah, you're not like him. You're worse than him because you're retarded. That's the main... And that's the ending that they went with. And like... I think this writer of the game thought that's like a really original, inspiring ending. No, it's it's been done to death. It's not original, and it's really stupid. It can work times. You're not like, kill multiple people getting to that path, but it only works a very small amount of time. So it doesn't work at all. So I mean, there's a lot to think, a lot of things to say. I think that summed up our thoughts about the Last of Us too. I mean. Yeah. Uh, as as Michael says, Last of Us One to Last of Us Two is like Saint Kirill to Dioscorus. It's basically <laughs> as basically uh it's actually pretty accurate. I, I'm gonna say um gameplay of the first one. Yeah, you said that. Did you did you do that willingly or did you like you said you said gameplay of the first movie? I mean it is true. It is a yeah, movie no, game. I, I probably said that because I like I said because I watched because I watched the gameplay, it was kind of like watching movie. <laughs> um, but oh yeah, I mean, I've been watching a lot of movies recently as well. I last time I played Last of Us One, I remember this. It was with at my friend's house, and my friend was talking about the game, and he he told me he got scared from the game, and I was like, what? Why? Like, you think that game's scary? And like, there was like a level that he wanted me to pass because he couldn't pass it, and like, I'm not. And this is gonna be me bad, but like I passed a level without killing a single person. I guess I was feeling a bit pacifist that day, and I was like, "Oh yeah, there's like ten enemies, and none of them know where I am. I guess I'll just pass them through and like just run at run and get to the exit." I just uh, like you can do that in the game. That's actually fascinating. I've never done that before. So, and then I like try that again a couple of weeks later. Uh, not a couple of weeks later, but like a couple of weeks ago this year. I couldn't do this. It was difficult. But of it, Last of Us 2. One final note about Last of Us 2. I, I, I know I said enough, but its its user scores are like 3.5 out of 10. Have you seen that? <laughs> it's like, it's like you, you see the you see game critiques. It's 95 out of 100. And then you see the user critiques. And it's like 3.5 out of 10. Like such disparity, and it was like this is why GamerGate happened. I I can tell that you what like when I talk, you can't hear me when you're talking. <laughs> I don't know if it carries over to YouTube, so we'll see. But um, yeah, I just wanted to ask you like, so what what is the scariest movie you've ever played? Because for me, it would probably be for me, it would probably be Outlast. Outlast. I haven't played it. Here's the thing. I don't play horror games. Uh, I watch people playing them on YouTube. That's most of my experience. But I did play this one visual novel, fully true. Um, but here's the beautiful part. I forgot the name of it. Uh, let me let me find it while you talk about the lyrics. I played that game. It was fun, but I don't remember it. Yeah, I mean... Hello? I, I, oh. Are you just, yeah, yeah, sorry, my internet cuts out a little bit. So, I mean, like, yeah, I'm, I've, I like, I always, I'm a big fan of horror movies, but I always find horror games to be so much more terrifying because you're kind of in that situation. <laughs> you're not <laughs> just watching someone be in that situation. And it can be kind of raw. I mean, it's, I always found it weird how, I don't know about human psychology much, but it, I find it, I think there must be some kind of like primal, fear of the dark thing going on like because 
the difference between watching a horror movie with your lights off and with your lights on at least for me there's a there's a huge difference um and it's the same with game with the horror games so i mean yeah i i the most recent horror movie i watched was the hills have eyes i don't know if you've seen that but me and my friends were just like, oh, let's just watch. We watch horror movies every night. But yeah, The Hills Have Eyes is about. I, I, I'm pretty sure some people in chat have seen it. It's a pretty, it's a pretty rancid movie. But, um, like some family of campers go off into like they're trying to get to I think it's, uh, Las Vegas or something, and <laughs> they're traveling in the desert, and there's like these, people who have been mutated and deformed by um like nuke testing in the desert that america i think used to do and they basically like do a bunch of horrible things and raid the um you know <laughs> the families the family sounds yeah. based by the way the game i was talking about is the letter you can find it on steam it's a visual novel but it's a visual novel made by a western i don't know if it's a company or a group but it's it's a western vision of japanese one uh i thought that it was it was good it was it was a seven the horror aspects were definitely well made the non-horror aspects were like okay it was okay but you know what i like about horror games horror stories not the horror itself but rather the suspense but i also really like and this can apply to suspense movies or vision novels or thriller is that like when you have an enemy and you have no idea when it might come to you and like jump up to you and try to kill you, right? You don't know that. And you're just like with a group and you're just waiting for that to happen. It's kind of like, you know, like, uh, let me give you a good example so people can understand what I'm talking about. I guess like in the letter, for example, you had like a group of friends just like in, in daytime, right? And this can happen even in daytime, like this monster can come in daytime and kill them. In time, they're just talking and just like wondering, you know, when is it going to happen? It's like this, this suspense is there and you know that they're trying to get away from that. So I like, I like that fact. It's like, uh, it's a real bond moment. You could say it's, you never know. And, and what usually happens is that a couple minutes later, it just, it actually does happen when you least expect it in my, my case. It's, but, um, uh, before dawn is a good, I, horror game uh have you played this or i i haven't played many horror games i i like the most i is amnesia watching the pie play asian like 10 years ago i think that's my experience at most these these are good horror these are scary horror movies that are good um i think the conjuring is kind of the probably one of the less scary i haven't seen the suspiria remake yet but what's evil's dead female i don't know that one is that i'd like to know is that you just mistyped that or something hello I mean, the, or... evil's dead female you caught off for a second i got scared but um evil's dead female so far we went to the turkish horror movies are so dog shit it's always about jinns do you guys know what a jinn is it's like yeah, these yeah. spirits. Yeah, you know, yeah, for sure. They're like neutral in Islam. They're like neutral spirits. Well, they can be good or bad. So that's what I mean by neutral. But they're they're, they're not demons because demons are always bad. Jinn are kind of just like, they're just kind of, they're like, just imagine us like humans, but bodiless and a bit more intense. That's kind of what Jinn are, I guess. Yeah. And there's a lot of horror movies about Jinns in Turkey, like, a lot and i it, it kind of blows my mind because bless you it's um when i was a kid it affected me because you know i was a kid i had strong imagination it was like oh, spiritual beings that will appear when once you say the magical words that's kind of like like you will get these um messages to you you i get you all of you got this like messages that you if you don't Cop paste this message in fifth places. A jinn will visit you and kill your mother at night, like that kind of stuff. <laughs> and that was like common. And there were like movies based on that whole like nonsense, like just like someone getting a message, like oh I don't care about this. Then like, it visits them and like, kills their family members, and like oh no, it's pretty bad. And 
those are like the bad horror movie stuff i guess Tur- turkish horror movies are like really bad turkish movies in general are like basically american but yeah. less uh verse ones <laughs> mm, turkey well known for its excellent movies yeah very well known like um actually there's a lot of really really good i am one but like well liked tv shows from turkey that people watch uh there's a there's a number of them that's like classics for the turkish neighbor i've heard from like in georgia or greece or whatever other than that's like who watches a turkish movie no one but then again like who watches a french movie or like an english movie i guess sometimes in english movie of english, have you seen a fish called wanda Okay, that's good that you haven't seen that. That's like the most dog shit movie I've ever seen in my life. That's like, have you taken any like theory class where like, you go to the class and you have to watch movies or you have to like do anything like that? Have you ever taken classes like that? Nope. Okay. So here's what happened. Um, film tier class every week you're supposed to watch a movie and you're supposed to like do a review on it in class we got a fish called wanda for comedy the whole movie lewis and the viewers the whole movie is basically this uh t trying to steal money from some place i don't forgot and there's a female character and there's like a group of dudes and the whole quirk about the female character is that she has sex with everyone and screws everyone over and everyone gets a bad ending except for the wood and the guy that's with it that the woman probably doesn't really care about actually in the ending it turns out she has like 20 kids so it's like it's like one of the stupidest movies i ever get ever seen and like every 20 minutes or so all you see is sex scenes and the woman's just having sex with a different guy and this is a parent this is a pretty common for people and i was just like watching that and this is this is not even a new movie it's like 10 more than 10 years ago i think that just made me think like people watch this and they entertained by this. We shouldn't really be surprised that the world is in this kind of state when when I see that kind of stuff. I don't know. I don't know about what Yeah, I mean the the the, the industry's gotten so hypersexualized. I remember when um I think I, I heard of this is that back in maybe the early twentieth century, the the Pope seemed to have a fair bit of control over what comes out of the movie industry in America because he would just, as if I remember correctly, I may be wrong about this, but he would literally just be like, if there was some horrible movie that came out, he would be like, that's an antichrist movie. And then all the Catholics just wouldn't watch it. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, 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 I remember hearing that, but yeah, now I think, I don't know how much of an, I mean, yeah, I mean, they really don't care what they seem to put out anymore. I mean, if you've seen some of the the movies recently, I mean, that's why I resort to visual novels, although they're not really that much better, <laughs> to be honest. But uh, depends. Uh, yeah, I just saw. I just searched on Wikipedia. This movie was from 1988. Okay, 1988. And you will think that it came out like yesterday. It's that kind of a movie. And it's like, obviously, it's not Last of Us 2 tier, but it's pretty bad. It's, it's pretty bad. Uh, yeah. And I definitely agree Like with with what JP is asking. It's all real propaganda. It's not even last five, 10 years like even before that it's all about. It's the same formula. It's basically the same formula. Look at Netflix. It's the same formula that's being used. And that's what sells, unfortunately. Like, I don't know if you watch yeah, Jay's stream. There are, there are some good um, movies that have been out in the past five to ten years, but what I've noticed is that the the way they'll rank, like, they'll give like Oscars or nominations to these movies alongside other good movie, other movies that are actually good, but then interspersed, you'll have these other movies that are really just like, what was the, what was that one with the woman that was fell in love with this fish monster or? um that was by the same director who did Pan i don't Africa. remember she can help chat can help woman falling in love with fish monster yeah it's like it was it was um 
Let me ask Google. The shape of water? The shape of water, right? Is that the movie? Yeah, that's the one. That's the one. Yeah, the shape the shape of water was like so the director, he did Pan's Labyrinth. And Pan's Labyrinth was a really, really good movie. It was creepy, it was atmospheric, and it, it was, you know, well acted. Um, but then he goes and produces this thing, which is I mean, the the villain was literally just the the it was literally Killing people liberal. for bestiality. It's basically no, no, no. a prep like well, it yeah. was the liberals concept. The bad guy was literally the liberals conception of like the evil white male. Like he's a military guy. He just hates people for being different. And he just wants to kill people because they're different. That's literally what the bad guy is. Uh, and uh, <laughs> dare and I they, say based just wants to be herself <laughs> just wants to, you know, be the free whammons and um, yeah, you know, do what she wants with who she wants. And uh, even if that's a fish monster. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and it was obvious, like really obvious propaganda. Um, like there was some scene where it was like some, it was like some some normal person going, I, I can't remember, but it was some, exactly, but it was some person going into a, he was buying, it was like his favorite pie shop or something like that, like his favorite pie shop. And then one day, the, the owner of the pie shop, this guy, like hits on him and he's like oh crap the you know the owner of my favorite pie shop is gay and it's like and he reacts like so violently like as if it's some kind of huge affront to him and it's like yeah no one reacts like that in real life i mean <laughs> come on if tbh tbh they should they should i think <laughs> but that's i am david <laughs> um but, yeah, yeah i mean in an ideal world, people will do that, but um, people don't do that, which is why that sticks, because conservatives are sensitive. You can race and they will say, no way, I have a black son and he's my wife's son. Like they will go that far to like prove that they're not racist. When I swear, I swear, I swear. I'm it doesn't racist. matter. <laughs> yeah. I swear, please, please don't call me racist word. Which now today, that I guess that's, I mean, I guess there's a point in having that attitude because if you don't, I mean, you're going to get fired. So, uh, I don't care because I'm neat. I'm not a neat, but I'm a neat. But uh, I don't care personally, but I can understand why people care about that because, again, you can lose your job. Like in, in England, in the UK, um, you can get poo. I remember, have you heard of the military contest? What? in the uk that happened in some banned far right group like miss hitler no i don't know about that i know some of some cases of people in universities who they had like private chats here like private chats or private groups and they would make edgy jokes and stuff and someone would infiltrate and just screenshot everything and it's yep. and, uh, yeah then basically mm -hmm. whoever you know literally just their degrees canceled and everything so yeah 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 um so this is this was in a band uh far right group in the uk they did the miss Hitler contest for all of the women in the group basically had a beauty contest and that uh got got leaked out basically and it was on like mainstream media i guess uh in the uk and the the woman participating in a contest just a beauty contest um got like several years in jail and that was that was quite shocking to me uh you know they didn't they really didn't do anything like they just beauty contest and nothing more nothing less from what i've heard maybe i'm wrong maybe i'm missing some part of the story but that's what i've read and the uk is pretty harsh on that kind of stuff uh which yes, kind of surprised me you for people here police here spend more time arresting you for edgy tweets than they do arresting you for actual crimes um yep i think that's pretty well known i don't think i mean mm -hmm. you have to be i don't think that's disputable chill to to think otherwise um and police here are like i mean i've had friends here who complain about you know police brutality in the uk but 
Mm -hmm. I mean, our police don't carry guns. Uh, I've seen footage of 30 policemen trying to take down one guy with a knife. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't... Yeah, I sometimes I look at American police and how they, you know, they actually just then no tolerance. And, you know, sometimes I think, mm -hmm. man, I wish, I wish we had a bit of that in London, but, you know... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember I remember seeing a video of like a female police officer, which is already terrible. I mean, female police officer, but female police officer being dry humped by a black, a black migrant. Very enculturing and very um, enriched experience when I saw that video. I can't link it now. I, have, I don't have that video, but it was like, like it was like so insane that kind of stuff happened. I think... The only explanation you can have for the police having the, those priorities is really that the police's job is not to protect you in the UK, for them at least. That's not their job. Their, pro their job is something else. Not really full details, but it's, it's another job that they're doing. And that's kind of like what people are starting to realize with the police is, um, is, essentially, is essentially that. And I think this is a... This is a P tier of mine, I, and I'm, I welcome anyone that can refute my idea. But I think the whole like police drama thing is also somewhat a psyop. Like, uh, like you have police dramas and all these police out these high tech equipment, and it makes you feel like if you commit any crime, you're going to get caught. I feel like that's kind of a psyop. That's kind of that's making people think, oh, you know, pol the police are omniscient. They have all these like technological. Yeah. And literally yeah. cannot do anything. Whereas I feel like in reality, if you if you do like, don't do this, don't do this at all. But hypothetically speaking, if you murder someone and you burn the clothes and you like basically erase all traces of evidence, I don't think you can get caught. I don't think there's any possibility that you'll get caught. I don't think people, unless the people is like they they say this guy's missing, but I don't think the police have enough strength to catch anyone. I'm to you know be debunked on that but i think the whole idea of those like police dramas is basically give that image to kind of alleviate people from doing illegal stuff basically i i, I that's kind of like my whatever it's good purpose maybe it's for a good purpose but it's for a good, bad purpose that's not what i'm disputing i'm just basically saying you know i think that's one side up that's going on that not many people are talking about and, and again i'm ready to be counter signaled on that it's not something that i bet all my money on but it's kind of like what i don't know what you guys think huh i said it's not your it's not a hill you're going to die on is what i said yeah i one thing i think a lot of people don't have a sensitivity about is like people complain about police brutality and you get this footage and stuff that's been cut or whatever but i think a lot of people misunderstand how how intense being a police officer must be i mean imagine i mean if you've ever gotten into a fight then you know that you will make snap decisions which aren't necessarily the wisest ones or the best way the best ones to do in the moment now whenever you get into a fight odds are that your life isn't on the line or it hasn't been for me um but when you're a police officer that is the case so the stakes are just a lot higher. And I saw this post recently that was all about police, you know, suicide rates and all this kind of stuff and how it's wild. Like a lot of them die in the field of duty. And so I can't blame pol police officers for, you know, for there being some kind of, for being instances where there's some kind of brutality that goes on because it's like, I don't, I don't, I don't want to die. Okay. I don't want you to, mess me up i want to live so in a moment you know they they can get brutal and stuff now i do think that there is police brutality issues in america and in, in the u.s or it seems to me as if sometimes they do get a little bit too gung-ho in some situations where it really does seem like i mean there's no need to get to be like that I, I, like i saw a video once of some 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 guy who was like uh coming out of his like apartment door and he was like crawling on the floor and the police I, yeah I remember mm -hmm. yeah and he just shot him and I was just 
it was it was crazy. I mean, but yeah. Yeah, that that was I remember seeing that, that was like that was a huge deal. That that's real police brutality. Um and but I think in regards to police brutality and how police should act, I feel like this whole anti police sentiment is also kind of mad fact. And it, and I'm not like a blue lives matter cuck guy. I don't really it's not a it's not a hill that I want to die on. But I think yeah. the whole idea behind it is really deconstructing authority figures because at least an authority figure if you deconstruct the police and authority figure well it's basically furthers your project which is basically about deconstructing authority figures this this can be a, and you know this started this whole thing started with against Christianity and like uh and, and you're not papists obviously but like the idea of deconstructing the authority of the papacy in moral senses, in any sense, has been a huge damage for Western society. And as I said, I'm not a papist, and I will first want to like you know, attack the stuff that the Pope has done and like all that kind of stuff. But the whole idea behind it, even if it's not the Christian way, the whole idea behind the papacy and like it being the moral authority, it being the structure, it being constructed in the West. And it didn't start even with the Protestant Reformation. It's really started recently. It's, it's it's fairly recent. Has done a lot of damage. And that kind of stuff, it's difficult to have an Orthodox side getting at is that that's the aim. And it gives you the idea of why are people, you know, destroying statues or any you know, of that kind of stuff. But in regards to police brutality, I think in the US. There are you can count fifteen more serious issues than police brutality, in my humble opinion. I'm I'm ready to be yeah, wrong, uh, but abortion. <laughs> I mean <laughs> Exactly, yeah. It uh, is number one, right? I mean all of these ones. Yeah. Maybe you can count twenty, twenty-five. <laughs> the insane amount of children who are being born out of wedlock. Um Exactly. Yeah, I you were saying about uh, the papacy. Yeah, I, th I think I think there is some credit to be due to the Roman Catholic Church for its seemingly conservative um, con kind of influence on pop culture in the 20th century, um, at least in the earlier part, um, which obviously isn't the case anymore. No one really cares what the Pope says anymore. Um, but I think there's some credit to be due uh, there uh, because, I mean, let, let's face it. I mean, pop culture today in the West, you know, everyone, everyone's attacking the Catholic church pretty much like that's, that's the, that's the cool thing. It's all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You you see movies about a psycho child and like, or like you see any movie where there's a Catholic cardinal or a priest or a bishop. You know for sure that there is like this. This guy is definitely the fucked up character. Eventually, it will be revealed. Oh, you know, turns out this Catholic character, very nice seemingly, but he either has been sexual acts or does this, this, and that. It's always the case in movies and in horror, in horror um, movies. Well. In horror movies are always like someone's possessed, and then you get mm -hmm. some Catholic priest to come over and. He turns out to be not so great, <laughs> or yeah, yeah. predator. Pop culture is you, you, pretty much entirely aimed at attacking Christianity and/or the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Yeah, movies, and that's what that's mm -hmm. games. And that's like that's this is something that people need to realize. As much of a criticism I we do towards Roman. Catholicism. I'm not saying this to be like a hit humanist. I, I gave this analogy to Subdeacon Daniel Kakish. I said, I do not believe our churches should be united in the sense of a hypostatic union, but in the sense of a prosopic union, where like we're not basically well, unless you know, unless you believe the same exact thing, then of course we should be united. But is that gonna happen? I don't think it's gonna ever happen. But we should be united in some sense against this kind of stuff because any attack on the Roman Catholic Church about their abuses and whatnot, 
is it carries over to the rest of other denominations, including R. Like that's why you see all of the crazy people saying, "Oh, yeah, you Orthodox bishops, you guys like you're pedophiles." When like, no, but they get the idea because of pop culture and is some yeah. truth the, to the, the, like the people priest. bishops the yeah nowadays the word priest first thing that comes to mind is going to be pedophile to exactly people. and it's, it's exactly and like there can even be some truth but who cares that that's i mean yes there is some truth but you're using that grain of truth against the grander truth so at that stage who cares right and there's some some people have made the point, and I'm not saying this is a really good defense in the case of Catholic priests and whatnot, but teachers are more likely to be sexual deviants towards children than priests are, Roman Catholic priests are, in fact. Teachers, yeah. So yeah. I guess I guess we should make movies against teachers and make them the bad guys. I, I sometimes wonder how... how... I mean, yeah, we see the headlines that are like 300 priests uh, busted as pedos in state. It's like, yeah, I I see that, but I wonder how much of that isn't being reported from other professions like like teachers and anyone else who works with children or people. I get the feeling because that's the t you know that's the Catholic apologetic route, but. I wonder, I really do wonder what the comparison is, um, whether it's just overly publicized or if it's actually an issue. And the one, I think the one thing that makes it a really big issue is that priests are even held to an even higher standard than teachers because they're expected to be yeah. sanked, right? Mm -hmm. like, That's, so, mm -hmm. yeah. That's kind of like St. John Chrysostom's point about to that. Like, if you're going to be a priest, buddy, you really have to have amazing optics if you're going to be a priest. You have to have, like, top-notch optics. Otherwise, you're not going to make it. That's kind of his point about that. It's just, uh, um, can you check, like, the stream? So I'm checking the chat, and, like, the latest message is, like, 13 minutes ago. So I don't, I don't know if, like, people are, like, uh, if, I don't know if they're resident sleeper or if they're just... The YouTube chat itself and um yeah i mean there's been leo's messages should pop up soon but he said yes it it's as if they actually differentiate between roman catholic and orthodoxy and they don't yeah he's exactly yeah exactly yeah and it's it's the same like vespora baptist church guys right um right. <laughs> i mean i'm i mean we're not Baptist, we're not low church when those guys like have those arguments um you know some of them you have to say they do have a point in some cases but then again some people might say maybe they're sorry i don't know uh am i choppy uh maybe i am because sometimes my internet might go you just got choppy for me when you said am i choppy you went choppy so <laughs> I'll, I'll be much if if it's if it's I thought it was an issue on my end, uh, but if other people can confirm that you got choppy when you said I am I choppy, then I'll know that it's a you problem and not a me problem. I'm really significantly louder, so I'm gonna chillax and get further away from the microphone because I'm like, I'm screaming here. So I just let I should be here and just like more chill. But it's an internet kind of um, choppy. But apparently you're significantly louder than me, so. Yeah, that's why I'm gonna like I'm gonna like go back from my microphone and like speak this way because or maybe too quiet, I'm too sure, but I doubt we can fix it during the stream. We can maybe do it for the next episode. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Snoop Dogg yeah. smokes weed every day. You're significantly louder than me. I don't know. I've got a mic, like a blue snowball mic, so. And I don't use it often. I usually use my, I usually use my headset, but I don't want to wear my headset. So yeah, this is my first try. But I, yeah, I. I, I think you have to take the. Should I? I think you have to take the headset pill eventually, my friend. 
do it now. Didn't you have a headset in the stream? I did, but I wanted to try using my mic. But yeah, I'll, I'll hang on. I'll swap to my headset right now. Just mm -hmm. because if it's really that bad. Father, just... Father Deacon had a headset and he looked bumping. Techno pre moment. You look great with the headset. Did you, you you remember that, right? In the debate review? Yeah, yeah. Hang on. Let me sort this out. And now you look like a gay Viking. <laughs> okay. Your there mic you is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Try talking. Give him give him feedback. Yeah, I, give that, give him a high quality, but it's really quiet. Now it's going to be loud, but not so great quality. So. Um, you can I'm, hear him at least, so that's yeah. That's I'm probably gonna do a search online for why is my blue snowball so quiet? <laughs> but yeah, why so is there we my go. mic so quiet in Streamyard? Please help me. Yeah, so, I mean, ho hopefully it, they'll chat, chat will tell us if it's uh, if my voice is still good. Oh, by the way, now can you hear me when you're talking? <laughs> Ba -ba 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 speak when I'm yeah ba -ba 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 I'm talking now right now while you're talking ba -ba 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 yeah blah 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 I can hear you, yeah so yeah. Now you, can, you interject me and be like objection you're a f you're a fiend, fraud fin you're finaster. a fraud you're yeah. a fraud you're a you're a you're, you're a Floyd for. you're a yeah. Floyd <laughs> <laughs> start ahead of me you're just a Floyd. ah you're gonna get demonetized <laughs> just... now you're gonna get demonetized. <laughs> But I'm I'm black. I'm Turkish. Turkish people are black. Ignore Press the fact that my Hoplo group X. is R1 B. I'm like, <laughs> uh, Hoplo. I need to send now. my cheek swab. I make Hoplo uh... questions. <laughs> yeah, I need to send my cheek swab. Some, some... Mormon Mormon company and um, raw DNA tested. Some some company. <laughs> company, yeah. Nose is itching. It's like. It's like, yeah, those companies. Some uh, company, yeah. Yeah, I remember sending my DNA to one of those companies. And the first time I got the result, it said 20% Jewish. I'm kidding, 2% Jewish. And I was like, yes, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in with the... Look at this guy. Legends. He Joshua actually looks Hernandez. balling. Like, Hernandez. Joshua, yeah, he looks good. He looks balling, man. He actually he looks, looks like... Based. That's He's like... like Camo based. The glasses and the camo makes In it very powerful. So he looks <laughs> what's the topic? I don't know. I I don't know the topic actually. You like, pick the topic. I'm just Joshua, I'm you shit the posting the life. Yeah. Yeah, chat can pick the topic. Yeah. It's been choppy on D Josh, side. Josh can Who, pick is the D? Topic. Who is D? Who is D? I'm not D. Come on, guys. You um, are D. What other topic? You are just a letter. Big D. <laughs> <laughs> Call me Big D. My name is Big D. I'm the Big D legendary Big D rapper with a with a one P. <laughs> Lil D. No, you're Lil, you're Lil D, dude. <laughs> hey, 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 hey. <laughs> uh, because, I'm a, uh, because I'm a humble man, and Orthodox tells us to be humble, I will accept that. And I will say, yes, I am indeed Lil D. Because I am humble and I have humility. Uh, remember, remember our video. That's like the most popular video I made. Which you guys, you and Snake, the video with Mailer Tarshall and his uh, <laughs> best friend <laughs> Ned Flanders. Yeah. Fed, Fed, Flanders. Do you look at that guy's name? Man, come, come along. I know this. Guy. He's on Twitter. He's great. I love this guy. What is that? Um, I think his name is. <laughs> <laughs> it's the it's the Kinoplex it's the Kinoplex guy. I forgot his name, <laughs> but it's the Kinoplex guy. He's very popular in like insult memes. So it's like, especially when jo Joker was coming out, or as I like to call it, Joker. When Joker was Joker. coming out, ki Kinoplex. <laughs> I forgot his name. I I'll call him Kinoplex Joshua. Kinoplex Joshua was like this really black dude who was like, smiling and he would cash it. And like they will make memes about this guy, like, um, oh, hello, sir. Are you here to watch Joker for the fifth time this week? Enjoy your stay. Like, <laughs> uh, that's and, like, me. That's me. <laughs> I'm watching Joker for the fifth time. Like, 
And then you had other kinds of memes were like, sorry, sir, but uh, you're not allowed to watch Joker alone uh, because of the new reg Like there were like rumors about regulate regulations in the cinema to prevent potential shoutings because of the Joker movie. So they, like there were some rumors about uh, having like, you can only watch this movie if you're with a group of people. If you're alone, you're not allowed to. Like, there are actually cinemas that did that, to my knowledge. Robert. Yeah, Robert. His name is Robert. Robert. It's, literally like, it's, literally, it's literally like, what do you mean I can't watch it alone? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, like, oh man, the memes were so great. I love Robert from the Kilplex. He's, he's one of my favorite characters in, in fictional meme verse. Is is great. Uh, but speaking of Joker, I mean, it's crazy how some movies have some hype before they come out. They come out and they actually are good, but then they die in two weeks. I thought jo Joker will be like this crazy revolutionary movie that we unforgot. And here, like, no one re remembers it anymore. Like, everyone was so mad about it. Yeah, I, I thought it was a great movie. I've noticed that uh, women don't seem to get, find it so great, but... Um... Gee, I wonder why. Mm. <laughs> Oof. Anyway. Stupid um... female brain. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I, I've, see, I've seen people... Uh, I've seen many like different takes on it. I've seen someone say, oh, Joker is a psyop movie to make men weaker to sympathize with the character it's like yeah <laughs> it's just like yes yeah it's like yeah yes <laughs> yeah what like yeah, and what, what's, what's your they point say, <laughs> what are you trying to say what's your point yeah if you're supposed to sympathize is it is it wrong does the movie tell a lie society? yeah no <laughs> is it lies no no it's not no. that's true that's so, the Joker legacy. They set the city on fire here, like, like because of the riots, because of the, I can't say that word. That's that's the c word. Uh, is it because of the recent peaceful protest, or peaceful is it because protest. of Joker? Joker. <laughs> peaceful yeah. protest. Yeah, peaceful peaceful protest means closing churches and going to BLM marches. That's a peaceful protest. Did you know that? Yeah. I mean, the kind of the whole thing about it being n like n not true, the the virus is the whole protest thing blew that out of the water. I mean, they're just letting people protest. I mean, if I see oh, a high, if I see it's an a, increase a... in oh, infectivity, if I see an increase in infectivity and I see more people getting infected because of the protest, I'll be like, okay. But I don't think I'm going to see that. I don't think I'm going to see headlines saying protests, BLM protests, increase virus infectivity rate. It's the, well, you see, you know, viruses are not creatures. If they see a very impartial cause, they suddenly say, okay, guys, look, these people that we're trying to kill, they have an important social cause that they're fighting for. So if you're going to like chill out for a couple of seconds, that's why, like, that's, they understand it. So it's like with the with the true orthodox guys, like or the set of cons. If you're a private heretic, you don't lose any grace. You're fine. You're completely good. If you're a manifest, if you're public, then suddenly magically you lose your ipso facto excommunicated. So it's like heresy is a nice guy. Like he's like this chill dude. It's like, yeah, bro, like, yeah, you believe in Satanism, but like no one knows about though. You're cool, like you all just like okay, it's like, but like preach about me. Uh, publicly and like you're not a bishop anymore sorry guys like but i'm just i'm just that cool of a guy but that's that's like the kind of the idea that some people has like uh the virus is the nice it's like and i'm half joking but when you see rhetoric like um nature is healing and all that kind of stuff like this naturalist like nature worshiping rhetoric you have to, to think like probably people believe that and a lot of them probably believe, like a lot of people probably believe that subconsciously, I think. Burning down the cities make the virus scared. It does, yeah. Yeah, it probably or does. Or maybe that's 
the chill guy. Aren't you guys not American? Aren't you tired of having to care what happens here? Okay, you give your take, your answer, and I'll give my answer. Yeah. You you give yours because I'm talking way too much, so you got a, a lot. Well, ever since 2016, America has been like my favorite soap opera to watch because like I mean I was like up until 5 a.m. watching the presidential re results, uh, presidential election results, uh, and then you know watching Florida turn red and all that. That was like hype. same, same. <laughs> was, like, oh, I cannot forget that day. Uh, yeah, when Florida went red, it was like <laughs> ah, yes, <laughs> but um, when, because, not because I necessarily. When Pennsylvania went red. Yeah, when Pennsylvania that was like game red. over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pennsylvania and Florida, and that was it. And but yeah, like Ohio uh, having points ahead, like what the hell moment? It's like for fifty yeah. percent Republican, like what? yeah, man. And it's this is like a competitive it, state. Yeah, and and just the reaction that all the liberals had, it was just so funny. And and because the polls, like, do you remember the 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 polls? And it was like chance of winning and it was like hillary is 100 percent on this graph and trump is like one, uh, 99 percent sorry and trump's like one percent on this graph and throughout the night it just went it just that's went like, like nate silver graph right? it just like crossed over <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> it was it was hilarious i yeah no i 2016 so ever since 2016 i've been like so invested in what happens in america just because it is like i said it's a soap opera and uh, but the, the thing is, is that it's kind of hard to avoid as well, because like our media, our mass media, the BBC reports on what goes on in America. <laughs> so as much as I'd like to avoid it, uh, you can't. I mean, everyone here in the UK constantly crying about Trump and it, it's like it, it's kind of hard to avoid. I mean, America kind of seeps into every single other uh, nation in the world. It's you can't really avoid it. Mm -hmm. if you're if you're speaking english chances are uh you're going to have to deal with a lot of americans so like if you're if you're doing youtube for example like half of my viewers half of my view base is american i think more than half so inevitably you kind of have to know about this stuff in order to be in with the in with these guys in my case it wasn't that like I was really invested in American politics from 2015 to 2016 because of the election and all that stuff. Like it fascinated me, absolutely fascinated me. And I still remember like a lot of people forgot, they forgot all about this. But the main reason Trump won was because of economic reasons. It's because he played for the Rust Belt. And said, you know, my Trump, he gonna give me a job, and they all voted for him. That's why Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, they became red. Like Wisconsin became red. Like how is that even possible? Which it happened. I mean, it's it's it was like lots of crazy stuff happened. But uh, about American politics, uh, you said exactly like mass media and. People we interact with, I mean, it's just inevitable. We either have to or we have to close our ears and like pretend it's not happening. And it's also, and because of that, um, whatever happens in American politics has implications in European politics because Europeans right. don't matter on there together. <laughs> they don't matter individually. Like, yeah, no I, I, don't know if, I don't know if rats. Craig realizes this, but because they started doing protests in the USA, we have protests here in the UK. Like exactly. in London, <laughs> so Japan, it's retarded. It's retarded because Japan. we don't have a serious police brutality issue, and the N word has no real history in this country. Um, but yeah, people just—it's just completely made up, manufactured zeitgeist that spills into so, us from America. I think. I mean, America, like Europe always looked at America, but not 24-7. With 2016, that changed. Now, yeah. everyone looks at America 24-7. Yeah, literally. Everything Trump does is criticized, is commentated on. Like, I remember this. I remember many events because I was like a Trump head for a long time. But <laughs> I remember one time he was in Japan and he was with Pr uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. My man Shinzo they were like at the koi pond 
they were trolled. Apparently, like there's this like etiquette that Trump didn't follow that people were complaining about that Trump just like dumped the food instead of feeding it one by one. And like the whole narrative was that Trump doesn't care about Japanese culture, he's so mean. And then it turns out the full video, it's the pre- it's the prime minister that throws like the whole food thing to the pond, and Trump just follows him. Trump just does the same thing. He's attacked as if he didn't just like dump the food and didn't like care about Japanese etiquette. It's like, like that's so regular in media, and like that's the that's the moment when I realized, that's the moment that made me say, the next time I listen to anything mainstream media has to say, I am parted if I actually take it seriously. That's like what I said at that moment, and I realized, you know, this is some crazy stuff that's going on. You overfed the fish, yeah. People are remembering. Um, were you listening to uh, Never Come to Down? Me, I had a, the song. Had a <laughs> you come, oh yeah, that's like the <laughs> that's like the Trump song. Never yeah. come down. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, I remember that. I remember that all dance. the time. It was so uh, yeah, it was so fun. Like when um, you know, P one, like it was just hilarious. It was because I was in a little group, I was in a little politics group, and there were some lefties, you know, mm-hmm. posting the polls and being like, oh, Trump isn't going to win, Trump's going to win, like making really strong, bold claims. And we were just like, no, he's going to win, he's going to win. Um, <laughs> even though all the polls were that against him. easy them. win. <laughs> it easy was hilarious. Win, the funny thing about like the We whole, kept their like, posts and they didn't age Trump. well. We like reposted them. <laughs> yeah, the whole like thing about Trump's election is that like Hillary, all Hillary had to do was win one state, like Florida, to like win the election. But Trump had to win like six different states, and like that's the reason why people looked at it and they said, "There's no way he can win this because he re- he needs to win like multiple different states." Whereas Hillary just needs to win one, and it's like over. Like win Florida, it's over. And Trump just like yeah. But speaking of Trump. I'm not liking the whole silent majority thing. I wanted to make a comment on that. Like the like he's tweeting about the silent majority wins, which is I don't know if Trump's follow because Trump has noticed. He 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 knows this. But I don't know if his followers have noticed. Trump did win by majority. Uh the majority of voters voted Hillary. And I'm not gonna criticize because I don't really I don't care about democracy. I think the college electoral college thing is better than democracy, but it's not yeah, that much better. She had the majority votes. So actually, she has the majority. Like the Democrats have the majority, not Trump. And Hillary was like the very bad candidate as well. So yeah. Trump doesn't have a silent majority, though he acts like he has. But I feel like the cope from his supporters, like, oh, you know, the reason why we don't have people responding is that, you know, we're too busy doing our jobs. That's a cope. Like you're just you're just coping. <laughs> There's some like sliver of truth in, but that's not the full truth. What, same, what, because what, what, I, what I thought was what I thought was crazy was how Hillary has literally no one to blame for losing but herself, and she blamed everyone but herself. Um, and we had in the yep. UK it was really it was rancid. Like I was I was just like why? I go into Waterstones, and if anyone lives in the UK, they know what Waterstones is. I don't know if you have in America, but Waterstones is like the main. Uh, uh, chain bookstore and you walk in mm. and on the table the first thing you see is anti-Trump stuff pro-Hillary, her book all this on the table is like new releases new, re- and I'm like what? <laughs> so this is why Craig this is why we can't ignore it Like it's just it's always in our faces now like since 2016 yeah and like the same thing about like people will say, for example, oh, uh, only ten percent of the people believe what she means says, which believe that. But let's say it is the case. Does it matter? No, it doesn't matter at all. Why? Because it's everywhere. <laughs> it's it's everywhere. It's the official narrative, and you can't have a democratic monster beast system without media. I think I think the media class is like instrumental to have this democratic beast system because. Any other system that counters democracy will, you will have to counter the mainstream media system. 
And so I think anti-media narrative is definitely like a gateway to that, which is, I think it's good, but um, yeah, that's basically my comment about that. Like the media, like media is just straight up evil today. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know, maybe you guys, uh, maybe you guys don't know, but in the UK, the BBC, which is the main, the main news uh, outlet, um, they're state funded um 100 percent state funded and bbc3 is like well, a subset of the bbc and their whole thing is just posting this liberal progressive stuff constantly um the last documentary they did on like abortion was maybe a couple years ago and it was like a, a documentary it was not unbiased whatsoever um they basically had this one woman uh, i can't remember her name but she was like some bbc host talking to like five other people uh mostly women one guy <laughs> the one guy happened to be pro-life uh and uh the rest were all pro-choice uh, and literally the first the first bit was the whole first bit was just talking about like how you know he the guy got to say maybe a couple of things but it was mostly just a pro-choice narrative and then as soon as you got to the um and then they were like oh we've got this pro-choice doctor to come here and talk to us about blah 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 and it was just assumed from the beginning that the unborn were not you know human persons with any right like that's the main discussion really i mean philosophically the pro-choice position um doesn't actually here's the weird thing about the, the whole the whole pro-choice um thing so back when the when it first started when the whole uh, uh, uh pro-choice narrative first started one of the main th ideas was that um along with bodily autonomy but one of the main ideas was that you know the the, the unborn is just a, it's just a clump of cells right it's not a, it's not a real human it's just, but um that now that you know time's gone on and pro life philosophers and bioethicists have been pushing the fact that uh, no actually science textbooks are very clear that the human life begins at the moment of conception and that's very, very clear in all the science textbooks. I mean, there was some article on, uh, I think it was the Mirror, where it was like, I polled 6,000 or so biologists, like 90% were Democrats and liberals on when life begins, when like when human life begins. And 97% said at the moment of fertilization. So it's not a controversial thing. So everyone, I mean, everyone with a brain, everyone in academia, everyone who's in this debate, uh, no, in academia i mean among philosophers and academics they know that human life begins at the moment of conception it's not it's not contested anymore so pro choice academia pro choice philosophers one of the biggest ones is is called um dr david boonin right he's a big pro choice advocate and his uh he had a debate with trent horn who's one of my favorite roman catholic apologists and in, and this is also his view at the beginning of the debate, in his opening statement, he says, I will concede that the unborn are human persons with all the rights that we have. So that's where pro-choice philosophy is at. That's the academia position. They understand that the unborn are human beings, human lives with full rights. There's no that you can't make an unarbitrary distinction between a born person and a human person in terms of that, like intrinsic value and humanity. But what's weird is that at the popular level, at the at the um, you know uh, at the popular level, pro-choice uh, apologetics hasn't moved on. The academia has moved on, but the pro-choice apologists they haven't moved on. They're still stuck in it's just a clump of cells. But we've moved on way past that. So to kind of bring this back to what we were talking about. Um, the the um i can't remember exactly what we're talking about but we were talking about um i'm sorry if uh, you, you if you can remind me but it was something to do with human it was something to do with uh politics moving on or something like that or could you remind me 
I don't know. I don't remember my yeah, short-term memory. I moved, like I'm, I'm, I moved on. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Sorry. I, I just thought that would be interesting. Ooh, I wanted to point that out. It was something to do That's with with, with 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 presuppositions or you know people at the popular level not not being up to date with what the case is. And yeah, it's it's really strange. It's like that in Islam as well. <laughs> in the, in but, Islam, but, the but academia is. Hold up, hold up. Uh, but you just got refuted by Mr. Craig Trulia because. That child's not gonna stop you from going to college and uh, making killer money and having random hookups. <laughs> so, you know, you know, but you know what's I funny have... about that is is that I I was doing my application for student finance, uh, and one of the questions when you apply for your like loan, one of the questions is, are you taking care of someone? Do you have a child? So if you have one, if you are expecting. You will get more increased monetary support. So, it's to, it'll it'll be difficult, but it wouldn't be impossible. There is monetary support, but I think I don't think enough invest in societies. Maybe maybe I'm wrong, but in the case of Hungary, it seems like they're like ramping that idea up. Is basically telling people to get married, to have a lot of children, and those birds up which is the sensible thing to do but again uh the whole i mean that's not the main purpose but one of the things about the project uh the modern project let's say is pushing individualism once you push individualism and that kind of idea you basically stop caring about literally everything that is important but however, at the same time, when you debate with other people, you tend to care about them. So for example, pro-choice people tend to care about life uh, in their argumentation when they obviously don't. They obviously don't really give a shit. Uh, they will make it seem like it's a choice between female autonomy. They will make it a woman's right issue, which is incredibly disgusting. It's absolutely yeah. disgusting making the life of a baby a woman's rights issue. What the fuck is wrong with that, you that, Sorry, is what yeah, I want that's to exactly, say. That's exactly what I wanted to bring it back to. Sorry, you reminded me now. Is that, yeah, the show I was watching, the documentary I was watching, the presupposition was that the, um, you know, the value of the child is kind of, like, it doesn't really, like, it's almost like it does matter. Or at least to the people there, if you brought it up, it would matter. Like, I think most people, if they realized, if they believed that the unborn were human beings with the right to life and all the same rights and value as us, I don't think they'd be pro-choice. Because I think that, I think that the, the justification, the bodily autonomy justification, um, it's very, if you, if you know what David Boonin's main arguments are, for example, it's very, very technical. Uh, it's based on law technicalities, a lot of it. Um, and, you know, like the distinction so between... So basically, he's a, he uses pharisaic arguments. <laughs> and so he's a, he's a sophist. But, but, then, right? but, do you know what, but do you know what kind of the two most popular arguments for... So this is like Judith, Judith, uh, Judith Jarvis Thompson, I think she, she was a big pro-choice advocate. Same thing. She will also admit the, the, un, the, the value of human life, unborn human life. But she came up with a violinist argument. Do you know what this is? Violinist argument. Remind me what it is? Yeah, no, maybe. So the, uh... argument, so the argument is that, um, sorry, like my, like my power level is mostly in this issue. It's not so much theology. I mean, like I, I'm good at theology, but so... The violence argument goes like, say, imagine one day you wake up and you've been captured by the violinist enthusiast society and you wake up and you've been hooked up to some famous violinist who you don't know about. Um, and you're like, your body is like being used to support his life. Um, and the question is, would it be morally acceptable for you to disconnect yourself from the violinist can you remind so so let me get this straight so you get captured by a violinist society you're like mm -hmm. inserted in this guy's yeah guy's like let's say yeah like let's live. yeah like let's say you've got some like five tubes coming out of you which is taking your you know bodily fluids or from your organs to support this guy 
I mean, yeah. And the argument is, well, would it be morally wrong for you to just unplug yourself, even though he'll die if you do so? That's the stupidest argument I've ever heard in my life. Yeah, that's not even the worst <laughs> one. But that is the argument. The argument's like, oh, well, that's just... Like I don't think bullshit. I even have to respond to that. I mean, the, the analogy just doesn't... It's not. It doesn't correspond. That's that's one of their main arguments, though. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Boonin's a bit, Boonin's like a bit more situations. sophisticated. He'll appeal to some, what some some court, some Supreme Court uh, issue around bone marrow donation and stuff. Was I can't remember exactly. It's a bit more technical. It's a bit better. It's a bit more of a stronger case, but it kind of all hinges on this on some very important distinctions about you know <sighs> concepts that have been totally abandoned by by skeptical philosophers and atheist philosophers anyway like the concept of the final cause like what certain organs are for you know like my mm -hmm. like my my kidneys are for filtering like my blood they're not for filtering your blood like me donating a kidney to you is an extraordinary act it's not an ordinary process whereas mm -hmm. a woman conceiving a child inside her a healthy child that's a that's a natural process that's not something extraordinary um and also there's the distinction of course between you know directly killing someone and letting someone die like there's a difference there too mm. yeah i see go on yeah, so I mean, th those are some important distinctions that are uh, brought up to respond. It's like, well, yeah, my my organs are naturally ordered. They have their final cause in sustaining my body, not yours. So I don't like the law isn't supposed to force me to do use extraordinary measures to keep you to keep someone else alive. But the other thing to think about with a violinist argument is that, like, yeah, let's say you're hooked up to this guy, but the analogy still is even it falls apart even more because you think about the fact that well um first of all that person isn't your relative like it's not your son like if that was your child then it would be a bit different if you start to think about it that way but also when you have a when you're pregnant you're only hooked up to the you know hooked up to the unborn for nine months <laughs> you know but after that mm -hmm. it's over which isn't something mm -hmm. that's uh, considered either in this analogy so yeah there's a there's a a bunch of things to think about but the, the even more uh, the, the 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 step up from the um from the violinist argument <laughs> uh which is a bit more uh technical is and you're gonna laugh at this one is like imagine you have your you're in your home in your room and you have your window um open and then there's mm -hmm. these sort of little seeds that fly into your window, kind of like plant seeds or some, you know, that yeah. fly into your window. And then when they land on your floor, they turn into humans. They're called people seeds. Like they'll turn into humans like a baby and they'll grow. And the argument is, well, would you be unjustified in, you know, throwing them out, you know, knowing that they will probably die? And that's, a, that's like the level up argument, like this is this is the level of of gymnastics the the pro choice position has to go to to uh justify their positions i mean you 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 get tired of seeing nestorius and severus and stuff but uh it's next level over there may god almighty give these people brain because i can't i only god can because uh <laughs> I think I think it's their brain has expired if they come up with stupid nonsensical arguments like that. The the bone marrow argument, like my the purpose of my body is for me, not for other human beings, is like come on, dude. That's just that's 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 nonsense. I don't even have to respond to that. Well, no, no, we would like, agree with the, we would agree with the view that like you don't like the law shouldn't force you to donate your organs to someone else, right? Like yeah. I think that's that's thing but the question the other question of course which i've which i've missed out is that the conception of a human being is something that you have engaged in an act in to cause mm -hmm. um which is not the case when you just get captured 
Um, I mean, again, I guess exactly. you could make this, then you could maybe get into questions of, you know, forced, you know, rape and things like that. But um, mm -hmm. this would still uh, take down the number of cases of, that's another thing is they always bring up, you know, these extreme cases and stuff, which are a very tiny, tiny fraction of the number of uh, cases. So yeah, I don't want to make this like a I mean, pro life stream. I but. mean, yeah, but, and, and what's also stupid about like, I mean, think about abortion. They kill the baby inside the womb. They don't like take off the life support. They kill the baby yeah, inside exactly. the womb to get it out. Yeah, yeah exactly. So like, I think, it I doesn't think everyone, even matter. Yeah. It doesn't even yeah. matter. Yeah, that's the distinction, like I said, between directly killing and letting someone die. Like there's a distinction so there even, as well. Even if someone... I accept this indirect killing nonsense, which is stupid, but even if I accepted it, so what? You're not indirectly killing it, you're straight up killing it anyway, because you're not yeah, taking exactly. off the life support. Yeah, well, I so. think I think we would agree with this distinction, the, indir the indirect killing and the direct killing. But what the problem is, as you've pointed out, is that, yeah, abortion is direct killing. It's not, it's not an, it's not an, even like an if indirect it was thing. indirect killing, it's still killing. Still, it's still killing. Well, I mean, then you get into an ethical question of, well, yeah, let's say you were hooked up to this violinist. Like, do you think it would it should be illegal for you to unhook from this individual? Um, I, I, I think it would be massively immoral, but I don't think it. Sh I don't necessarily think it should be illegal. But I don't know. You may have a more hardline view than me. Well, I mean, whatever view I have in violinist argument, I don't think it corresponds to a board debate. I don't think it like whatever the answer I give. I don't think it matches up. Um, no, yeah, exactly. It doesn't, that's the point. Like the the point is that it doesn't case. match up. The point is that it doesn't mm -hmm. match up. Um, but that is the kind of thinking it's supposed to elicit. It's supposed to make you think, well, hang on, it, it shouldn't be illegal for me to disconnect from this violinist guy. So I guess it shouldn't be illegal for women to disconnect themselves from, you know, their unborn children. That's that's what it's expected mm -hmm. to elicit. Yeah, and like one thing I realized, I, I went to a philosophy of law. Uh, class and legal philosophy class and it was decent it was good which is surprising because university class are never good but the the one thing i realized is that there's a lot of these hypotheticals that we have like kind of looked at and seen like the case of cannibalism or like the case of like imagine you're in a spaceship maybe you guys have heard of this but like imagine you're in a spaceship and your uh, it's like an escape pod. You're five people, but the escape pod only takes in like three people. What is the moral decision? Is the moral decision just like making a choice? Is the is gambling the moral decision? And it's like, well, like I think about this, and the first thing that comes to my mind, if I was like like a nat like a secularist natural law noob, I will be so screwed. But thank God I'm an Orthodox Christian, and I can actually say this is wrong. But yeah. like move on to like I could say that this is wrong and I can move on how it be applied and it could be consistent with my worldview. But in the other worldview, it's like it's all just these bunch of like little mental games that don't really map up to reality. And it's really it's really yeah. like every time I hear about this ethical mystery games, like lemmas, I'm thinking these are all just mind games. They don't map up to reality. Like how does morality even exist? How you're just passing that question and you're just getting to, oh, uh, look at these moral dilemmas. Before we do that, can we look at whether reality exists in the first place? If we can't, then what's the point of a moral dilemma? If, we're, if subjectivism yeah. is right, then whatever choice yeah, is right. Yeah, the, that's the know. thing is it's always tricky as a pro-life apologist to decide whether or not to take a presuppositional approach or to try and reason with them on their level on the classical level because i usually find the latter because the thing is i find is that usually usually when you can argue people into recognizing the humanity and the value of the unborn they'll become pro-life like that's my experience but um yeah i mean sometimes there's people who are really so hard-headed and it's like you you really just need to go straight for the presuppositional uh uh critique like okay well you tell me what makes humans valuable in the first place i'm curious to know what exactly it is yeah uh this this question for example this is like you can easily consistently answer this in a 
on an orthodox, but also at the same time, like it's kind of the nice like explanation, like like what do you mean? Like, is it predestined for certain that Stalin will be the way he is? Also, have to ask like, is there gonna be Stalin version two? Like, is there gonna be another person steps up in that's maybe even who he is? Or like, do we know what? Like this question is like this is the problem with like moral. And I'm not like I'm not attacking Anno domination. I'm just basically pointing out like. Some of the issues I see with moral dilemmas is that it is too vague. These questions are a bit too vague at times, so you kind of well, don't get, know like well, they, what exactly is I'll tell you what, I'll tell you on. what, David. They get they get very hypothetical, and the thing is, is that you can, I mean, I guess you can try and draw issue with that, but thought experiments. I mean, the fathers engage in thought experiments all the all the time. I mean, that's the whole point of the analogies we make to the Trinity and whatnot. So. What I always find fun is when you have someone you're dialoguing with trying to take these thought experiments up more and more complicated, you also up the ante. Like, so the people sees argument I mentioned earlier, the response I saw Trent make, which I, I, I wouldn't have thought of. He said, okay, well, let's say, uh, well, let's say you have a gun and then when you fire this gun, uh, fifty percent. Well, there's a random chance that it will spawn a human baby <laughs> in your room. How about that? Like, that's a better analogy, isn't it? Because you're causing, <laughs> you're causing the child to come into existence because you know you're in charge. So, but it's also you know you don't know you know uh, it's a chance, and that's a better analogy. And it's like, would you be justified in killing the child and <laughs> throwing it out if it was, you know, a random, it's like, I didn't consent to this child. It's like, oh, but you did because you pulled the trigger and you knew there was a chance. <laughs> so you can take the thought experiment up. Uh, you can take the thought experiment anti up as high as you want. I mean, one of the, I don't know if you've seen this one, but this is another pro-choice argument. It's like, okay, well, imagine you're in a an IVF clinic. Have you heard this one? You're in an I IVF. I don't think I have. You're in an IVF. You're in an IVF clinic. And it's burning down and there's like 5,000 embryos that are in cryo <laughs> and uh, there's this toddler like five-year-old or four-year-old or whatever and the question is uh would you would you save the toddler or would you save the 5,000 in cryo embryos and <laughs> and uh obviously the assume the assumption is that you're gonna say oh i'll save the toddler and then that means, oh, see, you don't recognize that the 5,000 embryos are actually 5,000 human persons, or you would have saved them instead. That's like, well, that's a, I don't know if you guys play chess, but that's like the, that's like the, that's like going for the noobs mate, where like you're trying to go for the easiest <laughs> checkmate ever. And it's like yes. for E5 and then queen. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, H5, yeah, I know I that move. Yeah, I know that move. And it's yeah, it's kind of like that. It's called the it's called the scholar's mate. That's what it's called. The exactly, scholar's mate. Yeah, scholar's yeah. mate. Yeah. That yeah. that's like a scholar's mate argument. <laughs> it's, that's that's how like uh baby mode is it is. Um but enough about enough about I have enough of those people. I mean, yeah, you can uh, look up reputations the, to these arguments about... on YouTube if you want. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we don't need to dwell on those. Honestly, you don't even need ref. It's it seems like it seems more like just like trying to diverge the main topic from something else, and trying to run away from the topic because they know that. Yeah, I mean, our position is about killing babies, and it's. I mean, I don't think these people. Some of most of them, some of them probably do. I don't. Most of these people are like. It's just that they don't care about babies. Um, so, for example, in the case of like the women that abort their babies, they're promiscuous. They don't want babies get in the way of their free, independent lifestyle. So, a lot of yeah. them have that kind of thought process where they just don't really care about the baby. And this can be, and this apathy, this apathetic uh, attitude towards human beings is actually not only to, from pro choicers, although it's like, characterized by them but it's like overall a lot of people have that apathy i know i had <laughs> i know i had for a long time um a lot of people had an apathy where they feel that you know let people die i don't really care that had that kind of attitude so i think it signifies a bigger issue in the world and that is that there's no love anymore and 
people understand what love even means. They think love is like having kissy kissy, more, more huggy huggy sex time. Like that, they think that's what love is. Man, that's not at all. <laughs> what yeah, love is. they that's think they think love is. Else. Yeah, this was one of the big red pills for me when I when I finally became Christian was kind of because I was an atheist was kind of realizing well what is what even is what does love even mean I mean from the liberal perspective love is really just defined as um doing thing I like like that's pretty much how it's defined it's if you love me you uh do thing I like that's literally what it is it's yep. uh i mean you will affirm everything i do uh you won't heavily criticize me or call me out for any bs you will just even yeah. even relationship that you, you heard this trope like if you really loved me you will not do this like that's a common line yeah. i hear in relationships yeah parents, but that was lovers. the thing that was one of the like i said that was one of the red pills for me was like well sometimes well, no, what love is is love is more something well i mean there's different senses of love obviously but in the kind of the political sense in the kind of in these debates there's the 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 aspect that's more important is love is desiring the objective good for another person and in that in in you know telling you don't kill your child is um you know probably one of the most loving things you can tell someone and exactly. i remember hearing this analogy of like if you're standing in front if you're standing on a road with high traffic and you in your head you think i'm fine you know you can't see the cars and stuff and then if i come over and i rugby tackle you and break three ribs and you turn around and say to me that was a really horrible unloving thing to do it's like yeah but you were about to get killed. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. It's exactly. And that's, that's another version. At some point, it seems to me like there's a lot of these things weren't willingly subverted. It just naturally reached to those conclusions. That's kind of what I'm starting to think about all this stuff. And political and philosophical beliefs, even like from the enlightenment back from the enlightenment, it seems like all of this stuff, like you, you see with conservatism, what's their main mantra? Freedom. More freedom, man. More freedom. And what is it to you? Well, the, the society we have today, that's what freedom gets you. And they, they will then say, well, not that kind of freedom. The freedom that I want. The freedom I want. I'm like, why do you want that kind of And And I noticed this. I talked to a lot of Americans, the boomer Americans, is that a lot of them are atheists. A lot of American, not a lot of American cooks, but there's a significant amount of American conservatives that are like atheists. They're like, yeah, God doesn't exist. I don't need. Like one of those libertarian guys that was popular. I forgot his name. Jay made fun of him. Uh, what was his name? He had like a cool sounding name and like he was kind of like in the I don't need God for morale. I got my own morality and I just need freedom. But then they do like the tranny stuff, and they're obviously saying that, that's not right. That's not that's nonsense. Uh, why is it nonsense? Well, you think it's nonsense, but yeah, you can't have these people in your worldview. So, uh, that's a good question. How old were you? I'm Lewis, answer that and I'll answer uh, the question. I was, I was 17 turning 18, and I'm turning 23 this year so yeah so when how old were you when you converted to christianity from atheism 21 you uh, well me, me i no I, uh, I said i was i was 17 bordering 18 when i converted oh okay i didn't i didn't my brain was uh switched i off. was thinking about this this really Huge cheer! I saw at McDonald's today. Uh, <laughs> just trip. I didn't mention to McDonald's today. Uh, how old were, was I when I converted to Christianity from atheism? Actually, I was just I'm just kidding. I don't think girls are cute, but I missed that joke opportunity. So, weird with me because I don't think I was atheist. I was rebelling against God. I kind of had this idea that like 
I don't really care about whether he exists or not. I just kind of thought like, well, whether he exists or not, you know, who gives a who gives who gives a who gives a hoot? That's that my for a long time. And I grew up in like an atheistic, sec, very secular household. Not a, like an overtly atheist, because both my parents do believe in God, but they had that back attitude. They were like, I don't care. Um, my dad has like, had has the attitude of like, well, if you need help from religion, well, you read the books, but uh, everything else that's the realm of you know secular politics and all that kind of that has, has that kind of view. I had, I guess, the dead way. But in my case. Every time I needed God, I prayed for him and he will be there for me. Mm. So in a way, I basically used him for a long, long time. Really, it was when uh, I think it was when I when I hit 17 or 18 and a couple of stuff happened that kind of influenced me to that direction. Personal stuff, political stuff, all of these together. And eventually I converted to orthodoxy in the political sense because it matched up with my beliefs and over time as i went to the church over time i start to you know really become converted now i'm, I'm like like i'm a noob when it comes to like because my whole life I've been atheistic so i'm like very noobish when it comes to like the spiritual life and all that kind of stuff i'm very inexperienced i never had that kind yeah. of prayer rule kind of like i never yeah had it's that very difficult for me to sustain uh a prayer rule it doesn't come naturally to me at all exactly i always but like, i just every i time feel I so like, jealous when of i just wanted who've something been, who've been raised in faith traditions like and they've kept to it and it's like second nature um yeah i mean that's a real blessing i mean because i mean if you function most of your life without need without doing it without feeling like you need it um it's kind of hard to um i mean i i always notice the difference when i've been praying consistently and when i haven't in terms of the frequency yeah, of sinning. yeah definitely absolutely yeah definitely um the times i pray commonly were like the next days after were always good days consistently i will have a lot i remember the first time i started to get the prayer rules done very well it, literally every single thing was turning up for me. It was crazy. Like I, I got a job. Like I, it was like when I was studying in the U.S. I think it was um, second semester in the U.S. at the beginning. No, actually first first semester. Everyone was doing great, and like I could trace that back to like me just abiding those rules. But like the times where I like kind of like it became tougher, and I was complacent. The times where like hit. And basically in life uh definitely yeah it's it actually does have like even if it has visible impact it doesn't change because uh you know it's it's way more than that and i always kind of had that idea that's one of the things that made me like christianity a lot is that jesus christ say um all a, a uh an adulterous generation looks after science that's what made me go like this religion like this religion no like I, I, like at the time when I read just Jesus, just Jesus guy, he knows exactly what he's talking about. Like he yeah. has a very good idea. And, yeah, and that's so like, true. I mean, the I moment he I, said, I, that. yeah, I mean, I don't know if you, I think David knows, but I don't know if you guys know, but I'm, my degree is a science degree. That I'm, I'm doing, uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm working in a lab, lab currently in research and development. And the kind of the popular concept of what science is and what science is like. Is nothing like <laughs> is nothing like what you actually do when you do the hard sciences. Most of the time, you're doing stuff and you're getting data, and you're like, "What does this data mean? I don't know what this means." Like right now in my work, right now, there's this puzzle. We then there's this process going on in what we're doing, and we're just like, we don't know what's causing it. <laughs> um, but we're going to keep, um, you know, just playing around and, mm. you know, it's literally like, I don't know. It's not looking into the sky and having cool pictures of nebulae and being like, I effing yeah. love science. It's not like that at all. And yeah. The, yeah, there is sincere science worship. I mean, like when I work, I do have moments when I'm like, I could, uh, I get really tempted. I could be like, I could, uh, I could do, I could, I could do something a bit 
out of line, you know. I I could, mm. I I could be biased. I could forge if I wanted to. Um, and yeah, I mean, so yeah, science isn't some unbiased process like at all. It's it's almost like there are presuppositions that get into science that allows you to enter data in a yeah. different way, congruent to worldview. It's almost like that's what's happening instead of the stupid evidentialist thing that's going on. Like when I first heard like presuppositionalist apologetics, like from Jay, not from the the stupid Calvinist guys, but from the smart guys. Um, it was like this is what I this is how I taught all the time. And like put having those like thoughts in paper made me realize, wow, this is actually a philosophy. It's not just me thinking about it. It's it, yeah, that's it highlights that science and not like the way you look at things is going to be very crucial in science. And if it's not consistent, it's if it's not logical, then it's not going to make sense. But how are you going to have the logic if you don't have the philosophy? Then people ask you, do university like science departments care about philosophy or is it just a mere afterthought? Because, you know, pop scientists, they don't care. But No, uh, I tell you university. what, um, it's amazing. Like, it's like Jay said, I mean, everyone... No one's taken a basic logic course. And um, I suggested, I did suggest to the faculty to have a module on philosophy of science. And actually, uh, it was very positively received, actually. Um, so who knows? Maybe it will happen down the line. But I think it's necessary. Well, you know, it can be positively received, but then it Eyes down. That's that's the common thing that happens to anyone. Like still received, very enthusiastic, dies down in two weeks. Everyone forgot about it. <laughs> that's, yeah, in well, my life that you do what, a lot of you do what you can, you know. Exactly. You you yeah, can. that's why. Yeah, because exactly. philosophy so, of no, science is one of those things that through. gets you thinking less, or at least in my experience, doubting atheism. Because as soon as you start seeing Hume's critique of induction. You start to think and causation and stuff like that, then it's like, ah, oh, yeah, I mean, this is really kind of unjustified. <laughs> That's a big deal. Yeah. yeah. It's like, huh, maybe this God thing makes sense after all. That's what some people think in some cases. Well, it may not uh, even lead you to think about God, but it will at least lead you to question more. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And, and it's ironic because I'm, oh, I'm, the whole atheist thing is about questioning and questioning and questioning. And that's what it was about back back with the skeptical tradition, which, as David says, uh, as, uh, sorry, Jay says, you know, we have a lot of respect for. But nowadays, there's just none. Like, there's no critical thinking. Like, I feel like I'm getting gaslighted half mm -hmm. the time because I see people who have just, who are just so confident in their positions, but they've never once sort of sat down and really kind of really questioned dug deep down their presuppositions and and that's actually mm -hmm. goes for christians as well uh and it's really it really kind of i do feel like i'm getting gaslighted a lot of the time because i'm just thinking yeah how are these people so confident like so like radically confident in these particular beliefs am i and i just find them so so unconvincing have i just because i went from that person i used to be for gay marriage and stuff when i was an atheist liberal I was never pro-choice, but I was always pro-life. <laughs> but I used to be for same-sex, so-called marriage. Uh, and I, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I questioned it down, like, and it's just, I couldn't convince myself of it. And there's some good debates. I mean, there was barely any debates, actually, in terms of, uh, pop, you know, popular-level debates about um, same-sex marriage for in politics and stuff in the UK, there was maybe one which isn't popular at all, but it had uh, Peter D. Williams in it. If you look it up, Peter D. Williams, he's a Catholic apologist, uh, same-sex marriage debate. And I think he totally mopped the floor with them. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's just not based on logic really. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah. And I was going to say something, but I completely forgot about it. So instead of that, I'm going to check this out. Hello, Marco. Another Catholic interest in East Orthodox here. Thank uh, you. Well, 
I should. I appreciate the help. I'm. I'm really bad. This is one thing that's funny about me is that I really appreciate. By the way, uh, I'm really bad at like with handling compliments. Like say stuff like, "David, you look so handsome today," and I'm like, "You're stupid. Don't say that." <laughs> it's like it's not like I don't like it at all. Uh, but with about um, yeah. Oh yeah science guys and how they're like gaslighting yeah that um uh, this is precisely why i'm always very mean to people who are wrong but they're very confident about their beliefs because i believe that if you like smash them in an aggressive manner it makes them go fuck like, if you say it in this way not all of them but some of them get a bit pompous like uh Oh, you're just too stupid to understand where I'm coming from. Instead, if you come like as a like incredibly confident, exhuming energy, this guy will. Some of these people will. Think, hey, this guy actually is confident in his belief, and he do be making sense though. In in my experience, at least as well, that's kind of like, I don't know why I'm like starting to justify my poor behavior. I should not be doing that, but whatever. This is, this is the man I am. Uh, yeah, in I. Terms I of, <laughs> I suppose we have yeah. slightly different personalities in that sense. I guess, I mean, like I, I have had moments where I've done that, but my method is usually kind of a Socratic thing where I just ask questions, especially in, and just get people to think, like kind of draw them into these kind of contradictions. And then they kind of like have this mm -hmm. light bulb moment. It's not like father Ananias. But, but Lewis, you are not Greek. You cannot use Socratic method. You are not Greek. Not you. It's I am Greek. Only I can use Greek argument. Okay. Uh, that's well, a yeah, you're 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 one hundred percent Byzantine, aren't you? According to your haplogroup. So. Yeah, I'm like R one B L twenty three, which means I'm the Balkanite <laughs> haplogroup. So, no Central Asian in this bad boy. All gay reek. Uh, <laughs> All pure Anatolian masters. I'm the guy who, I'm the guy whose ancestors changed religion and culture every time a major group conquered them. That's the <laughs> ethnicity I am. So uh, actually, I'm not really proud of this kid. But um, yeah, when you put it that it's, way, <laughs> it's funny. When it, when it, when it, like 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 with slavery debates that's going on. Oh, you slave owner, you're a slave owner. Like I'm taking like I probably had ancestors that stayed. But at the same time, I had answers that were slaves. So I'm like, dang, I don't really care. <laughs> and, and on the opposite side, where like people are very adamant. It's like, yeah, I, whatever. It's like, if you, I think, like in stupid debates like that, uh, like your answers don't stay. First of all, okay, and, and the second of all, yours probably have somewhere down the road. You just don't know it. Like, how do you know your answers never own slaves? Presentational mode. On. So, can I talk? Okay, can I talk about Saint Paisius predictions? So, if Saint Paisius predictions actually happen, which is about Constantinople being back to Orthodox and whatnot, one thing I will say is, if it happened, I get that will be maybe cool. But second of all, I want to say. Uh, this has really become the Fatima for Orthodox, if you if you guys have noticed. Yeah. And to me, that's a bit cringe. Uh, in regards to St. Jesus' prophecies, I haven't taken that too much seriously. Uh, not too much seriously, but I haven't, I haven't dug in too deep. And from what I've yeah, heard I mean, from people, that the word of mouth can basically corrupt what St. Paisius says. So someone might have heard the predictions and they might have thought, oh, that means Greece is going to take over Constantinople and like moving on. But that might have, I'm just saying that might have happened. maybe it happened, maybe it didn't. I don't know. I don't have a dog in the fight. But if it happens, it happens. I'd rather have Turks converting to Orthodoxy. And I think, um, I think there's like some kind of like a group, subgroup that just those prophecies to further like some anti-Turk idea, which I mean, I will be the first one to like criticize Turkish culture. Don't get me wrong, but hating Turkish people is not a personality. 
often. A lot of people don't get memorized. Yeah. And I'm not I'm not counter signaling. I have a lot to say about Turkish people and a lot of them are not nice things. But hating Turkish people again is not a personality trait. Hating so any a lot people, of people have that kind of mindset. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm I've heard, I've heard stories thing. of Turkish Christians like meeting Greek Christians and the Greek Christians are like you are not Greek. You are not a Greek. You cannot be Christian. You are Muslim man. You are Muslim person. Like they say the, the kind of stupid stuff. And I've actually heard people like Turkish people, Turkish Christians, like say that to me in private. And like, I I don't I can't believe that this even happens. Like, but it does happen. So, uh, I'd better have converts. I think it's better. Imagine yeah. Recep Tayyip Erdogan with Orthodox. I I love that. <laughs> I'd love that. Yeah. Minus the CIA uh, agent mode, but it's a different topic. I, don't want to I mean, I mean, Russia it. should be doing what? I mean, Ru- Russia should be doing what? If you've ever played Civ Five or Civ Six, like just sending the missionaries over to do the evangelism. Yeah. Like that's what they should be yeah, doing. I am, in my opinion, they can do that. Yeah. Greece then again, can't. I hear, Greece can't do that. Yeah, Greece can't. Russia can do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it might might be able. To, I've heard that it's, they still have kind of problems with getting their priests, you know, getting enough priests with enough IQ or you know knowledge in terms of catechism and stuff. But yeah, yeah. there's only EP that does catechism in Turkey. So if you're a Turkish Christian, I was watching this. Which if you are, I mean, wow. Uh, I don't think there are, but maybe if you are. If you want to get a guy, if you want to become orthodox, EP does catechism, ecumenical patriarchate. That's in Fener. Uh Other churches, to my knowledge, don't do that. Well, you could volunteer to be a catechist at your church if you know your priest well. You could ask if you could do that. Because, mm-hmm. I mean, I think you have the yep. knowledge. Um, so, if if I was, if I was, because I'm, I'm currently attending an EP parish, but if I was a uh and if i was at a rural parish you know which is where i was received then i'd consider mm-hmm. um, yeah so there's a question to you lewis and lewis why did you choose orthodoxy <laughs> out of other denominations? well um so kind of when you start getting or at least when i started getting into religion when i left atheism you kind of have you kind of a bit naive you know you're still stuck with your kind of classical foundationalist thing so for me it was very kind of simple to it was very quick decision to slice out certain religions and certain denominations so um i'd read you know gospel of matthew and i'd read some of the torah and so for me when i saw um uh when i saw for, for example islam and Islam believes that Jesus wasn't crucified and he didn't die. And I said, well, the majority of scholarship seems to conclude that he did. Uh, and it's even some of the most skeptic scholars like Bart Ehrman say it's one of the most certain facts of history. It's rock solid is what he says. So I was just like, well, I don't see why I should believe in, in Islam. I mean, if it's that counterfactual. Um, and then, uh, you know, Judaism for me was just like, well, first of all, I don't want to but secondly, um, but secondly, um, but if we're a Muslim, you will have to do the as well. By the way, they have circumcision. Um, too. you could probably get away with it. Though. Like, I don't know. I don't think anyone's going to force you. But yeah, in general, you should if you were serious about about it. If you're serious about your fic. But um, Judaism, I was just like, well, you're supposed to have a temple. I mean, it's kind of obvious in the Torah that the sacrificial system is pretty necessary for the whole salvific process so if you don't have that then if you don't have a levitical priesthood then it's not really judaism is it so that i mean that was just then i was like, i'll just not become a jew so then when i was a christian i was like i'll become a christian and by the way i ruled out paganism and stuff because polytheism to me seemed pretty incoherent i mean yeah. i was a fan of the classical arguments and all the classical arguments seemed to terminate in one god so Mm-hmm. Uh, so anyway, yeah, then like, I was Christian. Analog- yeah, an analogy of being like is a very easy one. Even though, like, I'm talking about like 
the algebra thing from uh, ghost theologians from the second century, like their arguments, I think decimate paganism. Like, how can you have multiple yeah, gods absolutely. if there's only one principle? If there's absolutely. only one rational principle in the world, yeah, totally destroys paganism. But um, um, then okay, Christianity. I just looked at Protestantism, and I was like, you want me to believe that there wasn't a single one hundred percent full true believer in all the proper doctrines? For 1,500 years? Um, no, I don't. I'm not buying that. <laughs> like, I saw what the early church, I skimmed early church fathers, you know, really skimmed, like, really skimmed them, like, just barely looked at some secondary scholarship. And it was pretty clear that they didn't believe, you know, they believe what the Catholics and what the Orthodox believe. So then the challenge for me was choosing between Roman Catholicism and Orthodoxy. And that was kind of the, uh, the difficult one. Um, and even even post but, but lewis but what about the assyrians and the copts what about them did you, did <laughs> not you even not, on my not even them? on my radar i knew i vaguely knew about the anti calcedonians but i was kind of just like i was i was kind of just like well you're i mean they're pretty irrelevant that's the and... life of being a literal who that's the that's the life of being a literal who true it's like <laughs> like who are you guys <laughs> Yeah, I'm not saying that's a reason to not join them, but yeah, it was a literal of who course, moment. Yeah, of course. And I was like, why wouldn't I want to affirm these other ecumenical councils? I mean, I wasn't getting into the questions of the nitty gritty of was Chalcedon or was Chalcedon, you know, canonical or whatever. It just Good. seemed to me like, no, yeah. it just seemed to me like, yeah, I mean, Jesus has, he is both human and divine. And those are two distinct things. So there's two natures. I don't see what the, I just didn't yeah. see what the problem with that was at the time. So mm -hmm. yeah. And anyway, um, so that was that. Um, but yeah, the big challenge was Roman Catholicism and Orthodoxy. And there was a point where I was just getting hammered with these, because I was in RHEL. I don't know if you guys knew what RHEL was, but RHEL was a Facebook group. So I didn't come to Orthodoxy through J. So all my reading, all my knowledge about the filioque and the papacy and stuff doesn't come from Jay. It comes from my own research and my own um, experiences. I met Jay like a year ago. I saw his stuff the first time a year ago, three years after, but two, two years after being Orthodox. Anyway, so I was looking at, I was getting bombarded by these papal quote minds. <laughs> like that was the thing that was constantly kind of shaking my faith, but also the, um, I really like the Latin liturgy. Like, I still think it's very beautiful. Um, and as a Westerner, as a French, because I'm half French, it was kind of like, yeah, I want to connect with my ancestors in a sense. And I also think this is very my beautiful. Ancestors, my ancestors, smiling. My ancestors, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, and my family, you know, because my family's my whole French family is has has some devout Catholics and they're all Catholic. Um. So, yeah, and then what happened was I had to basically do a deep dive into the papacy and history. <laughs> and when I did that, I realized, yeah, it doesn't seem like the Vatican I claims are really there in the first millennium. Um, so I became orthodox and I've stayed orthodox. And then when I saw J stuff and I saw the Essence Energies stuff, um, well, that was like a second nail in the coffin. So for me, it's like, if you want me to become Catholic, you're going to have to show me consistent evidence of Vatican I in the first millennium. And you're going to have to show me how you can reconcile the dogmas and the tradition of the Roman Catholic, which is pretty much Thomist with the essence energies distinction. If you can't do that, then I'm not going to become Catholic. But, but you see, you see, Lewis, um, I have the Ricky Bar quotes in a link where, like, the church fathers say nice things about the Roman patriarch and they say, like, use pretty names on him. So I guess you're wrong and a heretic and a schismatic, and you're going to go to hell unless you repent and submit to the uh, Von Hol Catholic Stolic Killer Park. <laughs> yeah, one, one thing I s I've noticed among trads is that they are. Like for me, the, the the allure to the Latin liturgy was very strong, but I didn't ever let it impair my my analysis or objective analysis of doctrine. Um, and 
mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, a lot of trads do. Connected that to that, that you hair. mentioned you mentioned Latin stuff. Are you a fan of Western rock or not? So, like I said, I had this period of uh, you know being really into the Latin liturgy. So I did mm-hmm. end up going to the Orthodox Western Rite for a period of time. Um, and my spiritual father was a Western Rite priest for a long time, a real core cool Western Rite priest. Um, uh, and we don't really talk much anymore. I just He just doesn't respond to me anymore. I think he's just extremely busy. But um, I think the Western Rite is, I think it's fine. Um, I have some issues with some of the syncretism, like pulling in the like the sacred heart and the immaculate heart stuff and the and the there's some stuff which i think some orthodox would be a bit harsher on that i wouldn't be on like stations of the cross i don't i don't see any issue with that um i don't know if you know what that is david um but stations of the cross is basically where you have kind of images of the stages of christ's life from birth to Oh, no, sorry, no, it's not from birth. Sorry, it's the Stations of the Cross. So it's the Passion narrative. And I think it's like it's like 14 or it's a certain number of images throughout the Passion narrative around the church. And you basically go from to the beginning and you like, you, you know, pray and meditate in front of each stage, right? So you contemplate each stage. And obviously the, obviously I'm not for any of the, you know, sensory imagination stuff, but in principle, the concept of contemplating these moments in Christ's is passion orthodox. is orthodox. So I don't have a problem with that. Yes. Um, I'm a kind of on the fence about Eucharistic adoration because, yeah, on the one hand, it's like, it's obviously a later development, but... It like, makes logical sense on the surface. Yeah, you say I, that? I, don't, I don't really have like a theological or logical objection to it to be honest well well i will i will have this objection i will have two objections uh the first one is actually not two. this is the main objection is that christ says take eat not take worship is at at first it seems like a very late baby but actually i think it makes sense i mean that everything has a point in the liturgy and worshiping the Eucharist, uh, it is the body and blood of Christ, right? But the point of the Eucharist, the reason why his flesh and blood is so you can eat it. That's the point of the Eucharist. Yeah. So it kind of like destroys the point of the Eucharist. That's like my yeah, worry I, about. I think Eucharistic that's adoration. one of the. I think that's one of the strong. I think that is the strongest argument. I can't think of any other good arguments against it so yeah that's why i'm on the fence uh but i guess my yeah my my only yeah the only thing that's kind of keeping me on the fence i am leaning towards it being eh, but it's still the fact that i i don't really i still don't really see like any kind of logical or proper theological objection to it other than basically you know this is what christ intended by that and this and you know because i mean it it I think it eventually gets consumed. I mean, because you can then you can just get into this quibbling over. Well, it's just a time difference, isn't it? It's just because the because you have mm-hmm. the pre-sanctified liturgy, right? So the liturgy of the pre-sanctified, yeah. the gifts are sanctified the 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 day the night before, and you don't mm-hmm. consume them until the next day. So there's these yeah. kinds of things like that, and you spend the whole liturgy not consuming mm-hmm. the Eucharist until the end, but it's been pre mm-hmm. it's been sanctified ages before um before, so yeah. i mean mm-hmm. so there's so there's these kinds of things that just keep me on the fence about that but i definitely uh, so yeah i think on the whole the western right is a good i don't know if it's really gonna kind of ca- catch on but one thing i've noticed is that it can be a bit of an like it did kind of induce more of a sense of wanting to be roman Catholic because let's face it i don't yeah. i don't want to do the western right too much but it's not the same. Like it's like an Eastern Catholic liturgy. It's not the same as an Orthodox liturgy. Cause yeah. it just does it's just it just isn't the same. Like it doesn't feel it, it doesn't look really quite there's still something a little bit well, off about it. A, a and the reason that is I think is because of tradition. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's because of the it's because mm-hmm. of the tradition. Cause these Latin priests, the Latin mass, they've passed it down 
one student to the next one student to the next like that like an un like an unbroken mm -hmm. chain so they're like immersed in it and they know it and it's it's, it's super authentic whereas in orthodoxy the mm -hmm. western right is kind of like i mean i'm gonna get probably get crap for this but it's it's a little bit it's a little bit of a patchwork like I, mm -hmm. it's not the same so when you're in that and you're like ah oh, I want like the real thing. <laughs> I, well, not the, I don't, I'm not saying that obviously the value Eucharist and everything, but what I'm saying is in terms of the aesthetic, it's not exactly the same. And that's so why when you're in Western right Facebook groups, they'll post like Roman Catholic, <laughs> like trad oh, masses yeah. every now and then to be like, oh, look yeah. at this. Like, um, so we should yeah, have that. It, we should have that, please. Yeah, we should have that. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. it doesn't. It does kind of induce one to be more wanting you know but yeah i i would say mm -hmm. on the whole there's nothing inherently wrong with it but there's just a few syncretic aspects in some jurisdictions mm -hmm. that i think and to be and the syncretic aspects is like the yeah that's like the main problem i have at western ryan is that it seems like on theory i don't have much of an issue and discuss theories i'm willing to discuss the theories but in practice it seems like a trojan horse to me and that's what worries me. It's the same thing with deaconesses. Like, you look at the canons. Deaconesses are obvious in the canon. And by the way, deaconess is a female, de female edition. A deaconess is a different role from a deacon overall. So for those who don't know, deaconesses, there are canons that mention explicitly the deaconesses. But today, you look at the people pushing for the office of the deaconess. They're obviously pushing for a female deacon. Um, yeah what, why oh, are you pushing this stuff weekends. that's the question like why at a root mm -hmm. be honest you just want to do it because you're being influenced by feminism it's that simple exactly yeah so it's a trojan horse even though in principle in theory it's it's an orthodox that's why it wasn't say. such an issue that's why it wasn't such an issue for alexandria to do it exactly um, because like you think you yeah. think africans are going to care about feminism <laughs> give me a break yeah. Yeah, they, they, as I understand, I could be wrong. as I understand, but I could be wrong, is that in Africa, there are places where women are highly revered, um, kind of, le I guess, maybe not yeah, leaders pretty, in a sense, but they're, they're, mm -hmm. they're, they have a lot of clout and, uh, you know, it doing that helps evangelism. Culture. Depends on the culture, like the different African cultures, of course, like the more pagan minded right. ones, I think definitely have female leaders. A lot. Uh, mm. want to move on to because we have like more questions. Thoughts on the new military? This, <laughs> this is go. a discussion I tried to dodge, Lewis. Remember, you were like, David, you covered maggot. You need to talk about this. So, my thoughts on the new military cathedral <sighs> in Russia it looks cool, uh, but no one cares about that. Everyone cares about the communist stuff, the, the hammer and sickle stuff, or like that one. I don't know if it's an icon or a mural or anything like that one of Red Army Victory and the whole thing. I will say that I completely disagree with that. As in, like, I don't like that aspect. Best defense of that, and I told this to Lewis, the best defense that someone can give is that it's a military church. And because of that, it includes the military history of Russia. So it doesn't have a communistic purpose, but rather it is to hide the history of Russian society and its connection to orthodoxy, yeah. and that's its intention. The, the symbols are there, why it's not and wrong. I think this is, uh, 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 yeah. And, and I, I don't want yeah, to know go ahead. That Sorry, I, some go people, ahead. some people can be convinced by this argument, and I'm not going to attack them if they are. Me, it doesn't convince me. The reason why it doesn't convince me is because communism is inherently evil. I don't think it's it has any place in the church, even like unless being destroyed this uh, doesn't a symbol it does not have any place in the church in my opinion so even if it's to it can lessen the damage but to me it doesn't convince me but if it convinces someone else then i'm fine with that um i'm fine so with that. it just doesn't convince so me so right so here's my take um because i've heard the best arguments from both sides um as you said the symbols there if we're going to interpret it charitably and I think this is the case, they're not there to, when you look at those symbols, they're not supposed to Glorify. make you necessarily think commun about communism, okay? Mm -hmm. These were still symbols of 
the military at that time mm-hmm. at the victory in um, Germany. Now, I got into a debate with a priest about this on Facebook. Um, and I, anyway, I don't want to go into that. But that's one aspect is that it's a his, and this is his something someone uh, commented um, on the video that because I uploaded on Orthodox Shahad. Um, he says to anyone complaining about communist symbols, um, the cathedral was built by the Russian government at the behest of the defense military for the Russian armed forces. It is part of a larger complex that includes a military history museum and memorial for the millions of Russians fallen in the Second World War. The following is going to sound harsh, but I feel it needs to be said. The cathedral wasn't built for hyperdox purity spiraling Westerners who know nothing of the pain, history, and soul of the Russian people, but it was built for Rus- by Russians for Russians. The communist symbols are part of Russian history and part of the greatest sacrifice that nation has ever had to make, and it is part of that great victory which likely saved the Russian nation from extinction through the fascist Lebensraum plans. Now, Russia is mo- working to integrate that period into their history in a healthy way and make peace with it to look toward a brighter future. Um, if you want to look at Orthodox cathedrals that don't serve this specific purpose and don't have those symbols, then look at pretty much any other of the many in Russia. But to those marking generalized statements like those so-called Orthodox in Russia, uh, shame on you. Now, I'm, I'm not sure I'd say, I mean, like, I that's probably the strongest take on that defense you're going to see. And I think it's important to note that the symbols are there to make you think about the victory and here's something that someone uh sent me in in pms after i had a debate with this priest they said they sent me voice messages um guy who helped in my conversion to orthodoxy a while back he said well the victory over the um you know the nazis was absolutely crucial for the survival of russia and even orthodoxy there were saints like saint luke of Simferopol and others who helped soviet soldiers I mean, and there were still, you know, some uh, Orthodox in those armies. So he asked me, like, is it is it is it unreasonable to think that perhaps um, God was providentially helping them in their victory over the Nazis? And I think that's I think that's a reasonable take. I don't I don't I don't necessarily have an objection to that on the face of it. So. My take is, and here's something Jay said as well. He said, look, there's lots of uh, artificers and architects who have built churches and they were masons and they included like Masonic symbolism in the churches, like all seeing eyes and stuff. So I would say that, yeah, I would say that it doesn't, these, this imagery, this symbolism, um, can it be baptized? Maybe. Um, But, it doesn't desanctify the church and it doesn't make it not an Orthodox church. Like that's too extreme. Um, I I think it would be better if they weren't there. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's, I don't think it's something to make a huge hubbub about like the good that's yeah. there is for me far exceeds those small things. It's a huge, <laughs> it's a huge thing. I mean, it is maybe one, or two images here and there, um, but yeah, that's that's what that's what I think. Um, that's my view. Is I I prefer mm-hmm. if it wasn't there, but it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't desanctify the church or make it not orthodox or anything. What I was more concerned about, mm-hmm. what I was more concerned about, which is I was a bit, I didn't really understand, was at the consecration of the cathedral. Barely any military communed, like maybe one or two mm-hmm. soldiers. And I didn't understand why that was. I thought maybe, maybe it had something maybe, to do with COVID, maybe. But maybe it's because of canonical things, like for example, and I mean like cannons it themselves, like yeah, you know, maybe they have killed people in war, or like, like not in a war, but maybe in a conflict or something. And maybe that might be the reason, or maybe they did. Yeah, something they might that... be on penance. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So um, it might be possible that, like, I think that's a possibility. Uh, that's something that a lot of people, like, forgot even commenting on that. I'm like, well, you know, penance in Russia, they take it seriously. <laughs> yeah. Um, on a, so apparently... They might have also felt themselves unworthy as well. I mean, a Russian parish. Yeah, but not. Most yeah, people don't not? commune. I mean, that's a possibility. 
most people don't commune yeah russians 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 don't commune regularly they don't commune regularly they commune uh some of them which is the extreme because some of like commune like two three times per month uh like no uh two months three months uh like once per month basically some like one per six months uh, which is the extreme, but some people do that. So that's kind of like something that happens in Russia, but that's a different uh, thing. So there's a question. Have I ever thought about becoming a deaconess? I'm not going to touch the clergy until I can memorize the Psalter and important parts of the Bible. Until I do that, I will not even consider it. That's my response. What's your, what's your response to this? Um, so I've I've been an altar server and um, it was kind of cut off because of the ecclesiastical crisis. Um, I was told you, you know, you can attend the P church, but um, you can't serve behind the old, behind the iconostas anymore. Um, so I'm still in a state of discernment. So maybe. Um yeah, God will guide through that That's everyone in the stream knows. Uh so is it the case that Mike is, are we talking about Mike Lofton apostatizing from what? Catholicism? I'm 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 following these guys so I don't know, but have you heard of this Lewis? I think he Mike means apostatized from orthodoxy officially, but I don't really he think was that's some kind of yeah, didn't you know? Yeah, he ran a like an Orthodox apologetics page. Um, but yeah, I I don't think that's a that's a topic worth. He talking was Orthodox, about. and he makes those stupid arguments. Wow, I actually feel bad for him. So, uh, oh, that's a different thing. Uh, there's like some questions that were asked or some things. Uh, one thing I want to talk about it's in the comments. It's about like the f- the conceptual formal distinction that I want to talk about. Yeah. So this kind of this comment, I want to talk a bit about this because like uh to my knowledge, the formal distinction is you know the kind of like the bridge between conception and real distinction. The funny thing about formal distinction is that the idea of it already existed in the Orthodox Church since forever. As a matter of fact, uh, and I'm not talking about the formal dis- distinction of scholars. Because that's the different thing that he uses. But the idea that Catholics are trying to get is already used in the church by many different fathers. The Council of Chalcedon uses that distinction between the natures. So it's a real distinction, but the distinction is understood con- uh, conceptually. So it's a real distinction, but the way you understand the distinction is true in concrete empirical means, but conceptual means. Yes. And there's a, there's a great writing by... Dr. Bradshaw, he makes the point that in order to have this distinction, you need to know the, this distinction through the energies. And so this actually even uh, indicates this energy distinction. So you can't have formal distinction without this energy distinction. Uh, so Scotus's distinction has to has a dilemma. He either has to admit the energy distinction proper uh, by Palamas uh, in Palamas's form, in Orthodox's form, or he has to reduce his position to conceptual distinction. That's like the main problem that I see. So, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, like, are, I mean they gonna, are they going to say the niches are only formally distinct? Are they going to be monophysites now? <laughs> yeah, there's. So Bradshaw made this point in the interview we did is that, yeah, like there's there's some things in God which are formally distinct. Um, but then according to this definition, but there's also certain things that you kind of need more than that because like, like a theophanic manifestation or the light of table, like that comes into being and passes away. So that's not just a formally distinct uh, thing. It's uh, it's more than that. And yeah, I, I, th- I think that's, pretty clear i mean how could moses see god's goodness but not his face and it only be like a formally distinct so yeah i 
that's my that's my uh my understanding is uh, it only takes you so far. And if you watched Bradshaw's discussion with, uh, what's his name, Dr. Goff on Reason of Theology, the most recent one, Bradshaw kind of like talks him into saying, you know, well, isn't that a real distinction in God then? And it's kind of like, and I think Goff is kind of like, yeah, I suppose so. so. <laughs> I suppose so. But I don't want to say it's a real distinction because... The moment they do, uh, we are the guys that end up being right in that view. So it, that's why I suppose in like this middle path that an old fail because it's just it's just trying to bridge the gap between two things that are irreconcilable, basically. Um, and it pretends that it can reconcile. But I think even in that sense, like people like talk about as if we never had that kind of idea when no, actually we have ecumenical council that expressed that idea. That's one of like, the craziest things that i noticed when i was reading about yeah hang on yeah graham's pointing uh, out it's like, graham's pointing out it's like yeah if you have this if you have that kind of asymmetry where one can exist without the other then yeah that's that's a real that's a real distinction that's not that's not just a formal distinction mm -hmm. exactly and uh i think i missed on one of the things one of the questions the do you want to go for another 10 uh, minutes and then wrap it up? I want to go for five more hours, bro. <laughs> we're going to... Oh, you're killing me. And, and also, there's another thing about real difference thing as well. Like, yeah, if the if the attributes are parts, like that's one of the arguments, then aren't the person's parts? Oh, no, now we're back to the egalitarian trinity where the three persons are parts and God is a first person, which vindicate dr ali's argument that's that's one of the reasons like that argument from dr ali is actually really good against every single other trinitarian that's not a monarch that's not a monarchist trinitarian yeah i think the monarchical model is so strong like i i i think it's really mm -hmm. potent in argument um i and it's scriptural it's very scriptural oh yeah it's mega scriptural like that's one of the things that really ticks off unitarians is that it's like, well, this radical equality view isn't really in scripture because God is like 95% of the time the father. Um, yeah. Like the term God is 95% of the time used to refer to the father. So, yeah, it is very scriptural and it, it, it satisfies a lot of the, the scriptural things like my father's greater than I and um, the only true God, the father, and all these passages that... Unitarians and Muslims always bring up. Um, yeah, yeah, I, th I think it's it really good. Like I, the emphasis and, is good. And the Trinitarians themselves, like they start with we believe in one God, the Father. They pointed out like a year ago. I think I heard him on and like clicked a lot for me. Like yeah, the Nicene Creed that it starts with God being Father. It doesn't start. Yeah, that with was the always Trinity. confusing me too. Yeah. That we believe in one God, the Father, and like the Trinitarian, and that's one of the strongest arguments against Unitarians, like Christian Unitarians, is the Trinitarians themselves make the same arguments you use, dummy. <laughs> and when I point that out, I'm like, oh, but you're just you're just inconsistent. No, we're not inconsistent. Actually, uh, they they seem to have this like strange idea, like they seem to think that we're tritheistic. I think. Uh, and it like, confuses them a lot, whereas tritheism is something entirely different. Yeah. Um, Emil, I'm just seeing your comments. You really need to read Bradshaw, and I know I keep saying this, but you really need to read Bradshaw because, in a sense, you need to know what energy means before, before reading like that kind of stuff. Like, if you want to use the term energy and talk the about energy you need to yeah i mean you need to know what an energy is and what the history of the term is and what what, what its specific meanings and what its broader meaning is cuz then you'll mm -hmm. you'll get it and i and i think one good thing for you might be to just why don't you just directly email Tolfson or uh, Bradshaw with these questions so mm -hmm. yeah i mean that's all i'd say is uh, yeah anyway we can <laughs> what have other people said? Tolson, yeah, we refer to this comment. Hold up, I clicked show, but it's not coming up. 
Yeah, it's very com- It is. Com- it's one of the most complicated. I tried reading it and I got bored. Uh, I haven't. When I, I get bored, when I get bored, that means I don't understand it. That's how I. That's how yeah. I get bored. <laughs> uh, yeah. So- let me. Sh- yeah. <laughs> I and the thing is, is that these books are so expensive. Um. So. <laughs> For personal oh, use only. Oh, gonna flex your books? No, I'm I'm flexing. I'm flexing a. <laughs> I got the PDF oh, and I asked a company to print out for me. <laughs> so instead of spending 140 quid, I spent 115 uh, quid. Um, and yeah, I was told as long as it's, as long as it's for personal use and I don't sell it or we'll lend it to anyone, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. Or <laughs> you don't show the pages to people and not. Yeah, and yeah. Colton's. I want to highlight this is a. This is one of the. And Mr. Dr. Branson himself makes the point. I can't, I don't know why. I think my internet connection is bad. Okay. Doesn't it feel like it basically, yeah, that's one of the main arguments that uh, Dr. Branson uses against the uh, Catholic people of the Trinity is that it causes an the Trinity. It destroys the monarchy of the Father, which destroys the whole Trinity, which also forces the Roman Catholics to have an egalitarian position. Uh, that's like one of the main issues of the lyric. It's just because of the things that people think about. It's about the father's role. Uh, like how can how can there be two cause in God? That's that is polytheistic, don't you think? <laughs> two principles, and yeah. The clarification, yeah, clarifications done and but that's why oh, Florence had to say they make that's the why the, but that's why Florence had to say they make one principle. That was the whole point of Florence making that definition. Yeah. And like the most correct sounding one is that there's one principle, the father and his source, but the son shares in that. But when you say that, to me, it sounds like you're not even saying filioque anymore when you say that. You're just basically saying the Orthodox will accept you know what ethnic profession is. Like that's kind of like what I hear when they when they kind of go with yeah. that round. I mean I mean it's the response is that when you do that you're confusing the hypostases. And people and like here's the thing is the word confuse here doesn't just mean like you're getting confused. It means literally with fusion. You're fusing them together. You're confusing the hypostases because the sun is is sharing in the unique property of the father and so you're literally when you make them one principle you're mer- you're you're, mer- you're confusing them you're literally merging the two hypostases together mm-hmm. so either exactly, you precisely. say two principles and you have two gods or you confuse the two hypostases uh doesn't the filio can make the holy spirit perception of human nature no that doesn't make sense because uh, Christ assumed human nature after the Holy Spirit came into being. You, is that will that be an accurate way to describe came into being? I feel like that's a dodgy term. Uh, well, well, the so this is where the importance of distinguishing the hypostasis in itself from the human nature and the divine nature come into play, because the 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 begetting is from the Father's his hypostasis his nature so yeah no it wouldn't necessarily mm-hmm. mean that it comes from the human nature because well first of all it would happen from all eternity because you could just do this reverse argument so you could say well if the son is begotten of the father then doesn't that mean that the human nature participates in the property of being begotten of the father before all ages mm-hmm. to which the answer yeah. is no but that's the that's the point of making the distinctions we have <laughs> that's why we don't smush it all exactly. together exactly Exactly. And if you if you are go the autistic, I never make distinctions. I'm a Tomish. Distinctions bad. They only exist in my mortal mind. If you go through that stupid mindset, uh, then you side with the heretics, but you can never side with any of the church fathers in any of the issues because their whole point is that the stuff that they're confusing are actually distinct from one another. Like with Saint Athanasius uh, about him distinguishing. Uh, council and what was uh, I forgot. I can't believe this because I myself talked about this in one of my videos, but now I can't remember it. But he makes these distinctions, Saint Kill makes the distinctions, all of the church fathers make these distinctions. Now that I'm on the topic of the, the high IQ father stuff, uh, I'm gonna advise you, Lewis, to check out Kenneth Vesh's um, 
PhD dissertation on Leon's to Jerusalem because I'm reading that. And it's like, th- yeah. like I'm reading it and I'm basically saying this guy said the same exact that Saint John of the Maximus, Saint Maximus said in in the in relation to the person of Christ, and he lived before these people. And like it's like crazy fascinating reading about this. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm planning eventually yeah. to get to um, reading Kirillian second secondary scholarship, and I have never read Leontius of Jerusalem. So I think in the patristics series in the server we have, I'm gonna for the Saint Kirill, I'm gonna kind of smush Leontius of Jerusalem and the secondary scholarship there mm-hmm. in with the Kirill stuff. Yeah, because his argumentations especially against the historians are like very very important very crucial it showcases why we cannot have for example a composite hype states like not only in the story but also oriental time which is which is a very big deal and one of the so for example there's two leon even like a a, a small critique i would like to like to make about joseph farrell he didn't point this out and maybe he didn't point us because he just feel like it or he just like forgot about it but when he's talking about in hypostatization well that term didn't really have a monolithic meaning with all of the people that introduced it in the sixth century uh for example leon's Byzantium, he will say in hypostasis is hypostasis that's what he will say so that's why the human nature is in hypostatize that means the human nature has its hypostasis so there was like differing views at the time. Yeah, but I think even John of Damascus points out some of those different views as well. And that's why like Leon's Jerusalem, St. Justinian, like take the more orthodox route. And one thing that was really interesting, reading from that PhD dissertation, Kenneth points out, St. Justinian gets his Christology from the priests. So it's not something he cooked up. He talked to the priests, not even like bishops, but priests, and he said, what do you think about all of this thing, the, these things? And he just listened to them. And he's like, okay, I'm going to repeat what you guys said. And like, just repeating the Byzantine pre <laughs> So that's like the common view of the, of the Chalcedonians. It's not this Nestorian position, but actually really position, which is a death blow to uh, not only to Roman Catholics, but also to Orientals, I think. I kind of want to mention that because how can I go through any conversation without mentioning that? Because that's the only thing that I'm good at talking about. Smiley face. <laughs> but I will recommend reading that. I actually plan on making a book review of that book. Going to have to read it a second time. AJ asks, was the only motivation for adding the filioque, I guess he's referring to the Council of Toledo, uh, to fight Arianism? Uh, what do you think? Man, so... Again, I have to plug a book. Is it going to be Shishensky? Oh, yes, it is going to be Shishensky's book. Yeah, you need to read this book. Um, and it seemed to me that was that was partially one of the reasons why it was inserted in the creed. Yes, by Toledo. Yeah, that's correct. Mm-hmm. That's not a lie. Roman Catholics aren't telling you porkies when they say that. Um. But they're telling you lies when they say that's the only way to exclude Arianism. Some of them make that argument. I'm trying to just find the first time it gets inserted. Yes, to counter the heresies, Arian presuppositions, anti-adoptionist writers stress the consubstantiality of the Father and the Son, emphasizing the scriptural truth that the son shared all that the father had, which must, so it was argued, include a role in the procession of the spirit. It was for this reason that the filioque increasingly became an important criterion for Christological orthodoxy in the West, and the East rejection of the doctrine was seen as another manifestation of the heterodox ways. So yes, it was it was partially to com- combat adoptionism and Arianism. That's true. Yeah. And that response at the time very short-sighted um, because if the son shares that the father has well what about the holy spirit does he as well it seems like very short-sighted right. it's, yeah. it's very unfortunate actually and it's and another thing that i've heard maybe i'm wrong but it seems like the vest also was like basically kind of had the view not fully fleshed it's basically 
the filioque review for like pretty long time that it, that it itself and i'm saying it itself uh was not enough to cause a big issue about it, i guess but it could also be the fact that uh roman catholic apologists when they point out that the word like the latin word for cause is different from the, the greek they do have a point but actually we're against their favor because many of because then we can say well Yes, there are two causes, you could say, uh, but what do you mean exactly by that? Do you mean an hypostatic cause? Or do you mean energetic, you know, that kind of like IT, that's kind of like the term they use. Uh, it, yeah, it would be odd to talk about like an energetic cause, like. Not energetic then. cause, but kind of like procession. I'm, uh, like, for example, yeah. Saint, Pope St. Leo speaks yeah, of a double energetic. procession. But, session, yeah. but that doesn't mean that he speaks of a you know hyperstatic procession because the latter well, kind of like well, Dr. excludes D Dr. Bo Branson points this out in his lectures is that Aquinas when he talks about the filioque and the Greeks and stuff he says Aquinas says yeah we don't really disagree with the Greeks in terms of what the term cause means it's just that you know so in substantively we we would just use the term principium or principle instead of cause because cause in Latin theology had kind of temporal connotations. Um, but yeah, Aquinas, according to Bo, seems to pretty much say, yeah, we don't really disagree in terms of that, into that kind of language substantively. Mm -hmm. But Aquinas at the same time made uh, one of the stupidest arguments against Philippe Tan, where he quoted the Council of Ephesus, says rejection of the Nestorian Creed which included a rejection of the filioque. The Nestorian Creed included the rejection of the filioque. The Council of Ephesus rejected that creed, and he said, well, Ephesus rejected that creed, which rejected filioque. That means Ephesus is pro-filioque, which is one of the, again, one of the stupidest arguments yeah, ever. Because as if, as if the council wasn't primarily concerned with Nestorianism. <laughs> and because St. Mark Ephesus himself points out that the Nestorian Actually, this is the one thing the Nestorians and Kyrillians agreed in with. Yes, and Ephesus yeah. does not. It lists out the things that are wrong in the creed, but the filioque part, it doesn't say that's wrong. It, it doesn't actually say that its rejection of filioque was wrong, uh, Ephesus says. And St. Kyrill himself debates with Theodore to Cyrus. One of our favorite renegade characters, Theodore to Cyrus, who... Basically, Saint Kirill say you have to reject the filioque, and Saint Kirill says, "Okay, I do." <laughs> it's just, and I want to yeah, like that's the... in this as well. So, if you want to know about mm -hmm. filioque, you have so to. So, I'm not making this. that up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got that from Saint Mark of Ephesus. So that's like a crazy, beautiful argument that he used. And it's and another thing is like reading about the arguments in Florence. A lot of the arguments Roman Catholics use. The same arguments have been used by bishops in Florence, and they got wiped. Saint Mark, it's it was clear that they well, they got wiped to the point they had to ban him from the council because he was just like he will just object, and no one had any good answers to him. Like they will have people like dogpiling Saint Mark, and he was just like, "You guys are wrong because X, Z," and there was no answer. And another crazy thing about the debates in the Florence is. In the Florence, what the frick is wrong with me? In Florence, is the first argument. You know for sure, Lewis. This is the funniest thing. The first argument was that you Greeks are heretics. You changed the creed. The creed always had the filioque, and then turns yeah. out everyone found out it wasn't the case. So like, ah, uh, yeah. well, yeah, there were some really awkward change. moments. <laughs> there were some awkward moments because they. It's not a change. It's it, a clarification. And, you know, there was this really awkward moment in the council um, where the Latins bring forward this, I think it's like, a, it's either Nicaea 1 or Nicaea 2, they have like some Latin copy of it, and it has the the filioque inserted in the in the creed, and they're like, look, see, look, it's always been there, and the Greeks are just like pulling out their Greek manuscripts, and they're like, but that's not in ours. <laughs> it's like really awkward <laughs> moments like that. <laughs> and they're going to be like, well, I mean... This happened, you know, in your empire, not your, so, you know, what's going on over here? It's kind of like that as well. Um, like, with, with the whole manuscripts, like, we're so lucky 
to that's another thing. We're so lucky to know which math scripts are wrong and which math scripts are right. Because they didn't have that luxury, you see. And this happened like this was relevant in one of the issues, one of the things in the Oriental uh schism, in the anti Chalcedonian schism is a lot of people saw the Christian quotations say one nature and they thought that they were authentic quotations. And it took them a century to find out actually they were from Apollinarius. But many anti Christians used those arguments that, well, me, a physicist, has patristic basis. The physicist, find me, find me, and I need to to speak of two natures. Well, first of all, they do, but that's a different topic. But um, that was a very strong argument for anti Christians at the time. So, like, we are so lucky that we actually know ones are good, ones are fake. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great time to be alive when you're getting like. Uh, when you're getting like new translations of stuff like patristics has gotten exactly. really really cutting edge in the past 50 100 years 50 years really cutting edge so lucky. i hope i hope i hope we'll get translations of stuff that we don't have like, I, I hope we'll get translations 11th, i don't need an 11th translation of augustine's confession i don't need it <laughs> I don't need, I, I really I don't need don't. a translation of Origins First Principles. All I need yeah. to do is read St. Photius' review of it, and he basically says, This book is blasphemous. And like that's like before you read the book, I just want to let you know that Origin is a retard and he's a blasphemer and he's a heretic. Like that's that's basically St. Photius' review of Origins First Principles. And in relation to like um any major text out here translated into English, I believe, and I'm not 100% sure, but I think it's not a major, so I shouldn't even be saying this, but Leon's Jerusalem against Nestorians and um, against ne Leon's is against this is not translated against Malthus is translated, but against this, to my knowledge, is not. I can't find it anywhere. Any major uh, patristic yeah, text, there, they don't really there's loads. There's, there's loads. Um, it depends what you mean by major. I mean, I... Well, I guess some are translated into English, but you need to do a hell of a lot of digging to find them. Yeah. Um, so I was looking for one of St. Gregory Nyssa's uh, kind of lesser known dogmatic works. It's called Ad Grecos or To the Greeks. Um, and there's only two existing English translations of it. One is in this was in this digital 2011 conference. Like I had to look at a Brill publication for this, and the second one was in this Greek Orthodox theological review from 1967 or something like that. Those are the only two English translations, and I had to like ask people to hunt it down for me who had access to because I'm at a STEM uni, so I can't <laughs> access you know liberal arts stuff. So I had to ask someone to do that for me or. I there use my Scripty is. subscription as well sometimes because I have a subscription on Scripty because I'm educated. Um, and uh, yeah, like there's some stuff like that. If you go on New Advent and you look at some of the letters of the Cappadocians, you'll see it's like letter one, two, six, eight, ten. It will skip letters. 117. <laughs> yeah, it will skip letters. You won't have all uh, the letters other... there. I, I remember one patristic text. Saint Isidore's book on, uh, I believe his book where he categorizes how different races act is <laughs> untranslated. I don't remember the exact name of the book, but it's in an Orto Christian article. It's literally, the whole book is literally Saint Isidore writing about how different races act. Uh, that's a book I love to cite to people that like are mega uh, liberal, like, like left cats, like they will flip if they read that book, but that's an actual book. Another book is uh, Kirillov Skytopolis' works are not like, we don't have them. I don't think they're even not trans, they don't have them anymore. We don't even have the scripts anymore. That's a big deal. Um, nothing really comes to mind to, to for me a lot. It's like these like obscure yeah. people, because when you look into the obscure people, oh yeah, another one. Um, Patriarch Theodorus, this is uh, Patriarch Theodosius. Patriarch Theodosius's uh, writings against Agnote. That's a, that's one that's untranslated. We have the Latin mm. translation, and we have the Syriac translation, but we don't have the English translation. And I think that's important 
Because I think it's going to be really relevant in the monocyte controversy for us understanding it. Because I think, this is my pet theory, is that uh, anti Chalcedonian monotilitism already happened. The it happened in this century. It happened in the next century for them. And we just don't have too much information about it because they're not transit. But once yeah. they transit, I think it's going to be groundbreaking, I think. Yeah. Um, another one is, a big one is uh, St. Maximus is a puscular. Um, as far as I'm aware, the majority of them are not translated into English uh, as a thing you can just find online easily. Um, difficult to find. Um, and the Apuscula have a lot of really uh, good stuff in. Uh, Gregory of Nazianzus is, like I said, homilies and, uh, and letters of the Cappadocians I've been trawling through since um, putting stuff up on the discord um trying to pick out the specific dogmatic ones i've had to go to find them in you know not on new advent like um so yeah and the thing is, is when you do this hunting you tend to find out who the big kind of like modern translators are like like mark del cogliano like he's does a lot of stuff in basil he's translated stuff like if you go on the discord mm -hmm. the dogmatic or theological homilies of saint basil that i've put in the lists they're all translated by Del Cogliano, um, and they're in these little yeah. tiny little booklets, which are not like you're not like like one of them's called on on feasts and on fasting and feasts, and there's one highly dogmatic theological homily in that one little thin book of homilies of Basil that aren't on New Advent. <laughs> oh, give me a break. So Parker asks, is Russia the third row an actual thing uh, i will quote one of the russian priests himself first rome second rome third rome we had enough of these romes that's my that's my response uh yeah is it I an actual really thing well first of all i will say there can't be a third rome but the second rome we don't even have second rome because uh roman empire the, the roman empire that we knew from the ancient times from the roman era is the same roman empire that fell in night uh, 14 53. So I don't even believe there's this idea of second world. People say, well, it's Constantinople, which then, yeah, but... Well, the canons that, call it second that. Rome. The canons call it second Rome. That's true. That's true. But I think when, like, when it's Moscow's third Rome, I think it's more than, like, you're talking about something more than the city. I think you're talking about the civilization, the continuation. And there's definitely some continuation between Russia and the Roman Empire. Now, don't get me wrong, but the third Rome thing doesn't convince me. I think it's a bit uh, larpy. Second Rome, I, I will say one thing, though, is that I watched this uh, secular history channel, and they like did an interview with a bunch of people, a bunch of people who are historians. Well, not, I don't know if they're like degreed historians, but they're like pop historians. Um, and they all did a kind of a vote on which which civilization or which country has the biggest claim to being the successors to rome um and there was like spain uh it was like russia and spain and russia are the two big ones and then there was some others i think it was i think even france was there but the majority vote was actually for germany? russia yeah germany mm. as well yeah i think the majority vote though was Don't actually for russia by a pretty yeah. big landslide as well i can find it and link mm -hmm. it hang on yeah, I mean, I think Russia, I don't think Moscow is third Rome, but I think R Russia and Moscow is deadly, like, has a lot of connection with the Roman Empire, 100%. And I'm, when I say Roman Empire, I'm including the Byzantine Here you go, look, Empire. I'll, I'll link it. I'm, I'm, I'm putting a link in the in the in the in the chat <laughs> if you want to watch that video. But that's um, me. That's me. Yeah. Uh, that like compared to Spain, Germany, France, Italy, even like who are they? Yeah, sorry, the Ottomans as well. So the final vote was five for Russia, four for Ottomans, one for Habsburg, and two for Napoleon. So yeah, I mean, I was People pretty surprised. Put the Ottomans in. Yeah, I mean, in a militaristic sense, yeah, but it's right. like. Well, you can go look at their arguments Doesn't and see what sense. convinces you. You can go look at their arguments and see what convinces yeah, you. But I yeah, found yeah. that, and I thought because that was—I thought I was like, if you want to push third Rome narrative, you can use this as a citation because it's a bunch of people yeah, who have absolutely like, no stake in it with, whatsoever. With, with <laughs> the Ottomans, 
with the Ottoman thing, um, it seems to me like especially in modern Turkish scholarship, historical scholarship, they're trying to push the idea of Rome to like pagan ancient Rome. That's what like Turkish historians are trying to do that very uh, subtly. They're not explicit about it, but they're very subtle about it. Uh, where they try to like make Rome, like trying to divorce Roman Empire from its Christian past. And they're trying to make it like this like pagan pragmatic civilization that just happened to be Christian. Uh, which is definitely the historically illiterate thing to but I think that's like I think that idea comes from like the Ottoman Empire itself where they kind of wanted to do that. And it's not even because I'm not gonna come up with like something silly like, oh I just hated Christianity so much and maybe but I think the main motivation was basically that like if we keep the idea of Christianity alive with our populace, then we're gonna be screwed one way or the other because we have a lot of Christians in our land. So we have to kind of like make them more subservient. That's that's not like the idea behind it from the Ottoman Empire. So I think mm. it comes from that in the East and in the West it comes from the supposedly holy, the supposedly Roman, and the supposedly empire confederation of states. Um, that's David, kind of I, like I, where those David, I, I know you, I know, I know you love this podcast, and you want to do this. Uh, but is it okay if we wrap up in like ten minutes? <laughs> yeah, we did, we talked for three years. I think that's pretty. Yeah, long. I think that's. Yeah. I think that's pretty good. Gotta, <laughs> you gotta save more energy for the other ones. You gotta break <laughs> records, but we are here breaking records. Uh, we can we can wrap it up. Um, I guess yeah, I'll wrap it up by this and then yeah. wrap it up. Yeah, I mean we can do ten yeah, minutes if you uh, want. So okay, let's 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 uh come to the first, last ten more minutes by saying yeah. Uh, women suck, right? Haha. <laughs> nah, just kidding. Uh, or am I? But what's <laughs> with Sergey <Unless>. Romano? <laughs> I have no idea. I have no idea who this guy is. Do you know him, Luz? Uh, no. No. Okay, so, uh, I'm not going to be able to Is he some, like, is he some, a, uh, let's, he, well, he, he must be some descendant of the Romanovs. I mean, he must be some r r royalty or something. Is he, like, a... Yeah. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. He was assassinated in 1905. So, he must, he wasn't one of, he wasn't, uh, I don't know. I have no idea. Uh, oh, it's it's coming. It's Duke Sergei Alexandrovich. No, it's talking about the priest Sergei Romano. Oh, you know Father Sergei Romano, the one who sees the Russian monastery, who denies uh, COVID and all that. that oh, I'm guy. not a fan. No, I think he's bad news. Why? Why? Um, well, I mean, have you? Is is all? Is all you've seen the title about him? Because um, oh yeah, yeah I only see the pilot about him. So I don't yeah, because he's he's, about he's him. like a he's a as far as I've seen he's he's a borderline schismat uh, in terms of his behavior, and there's some uh, really if you've seen some footage of some of the stuff he does at the monastery, like he he like he like uh, I don't even oh I'll be he 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 does like exorcisms on on like people to like remove the demon of like technology or whatever from them like it's, it's kind of it's kind of odd uh yeah uh, and, not, very, uh, and uh yeah seems... i mean sieging a woman's monastery with a bunch of cossacks um yeah no and disobeying your bishop that's, that's... like that yeah. i mean in that way like if you want to go off and if you want to go and you know, serve liturgy in public, you know, defying your bishop, that's a different thing. But laying siege on a women's monastery with a bunch of men is really uh, out of order, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, if if women did that, we'd probably, I will probably bitch about it all the time, but like, like why is a man seizing a woman's monastery? Why a woman's monastery? And it's not even about women issues, it's not about the monastery itself, if it even is about that monastery. Maybe the, I don't know. Like it seems I have no I have a lot of information. I'm I'm wrong side in this information divide, so I I'm not gonna be able to comment too much on that. But what kind of like uh schismatic 
or like schismatic ish things have he, has he said done uh i mean i i've it's just the it's just the like i said it's just the the behavior of just completely disobeying your bishop on every on every uh point i mean like i and i've i know some 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 pious orthodox who have bad things to say about him as well so on live scene online so i just would kind of stay away from that stuff personally oh let me let me let me hit you hard with one of the hard questions because I can't, I can't answer this because I never dated someone first of all, and th these kind of questions are like out of my uh, expertise. So I'm going on a date with a Catholic. How should I approach the Orthodox conversation? There ain't many Orthodox Christians in Miami. The first thing I want to say is that it is the case that we are very anti-interfaith marriage kind of religion, but it's also <laughs> the reality that there aren't many Orthodox Christians in Miami. Uh, so what do you do? I cannot give you advice because I've never dated and I'm a wrong sider. So Lewis, if you can, your eyes into this. We need I'm not here. sure why. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, like, yeah, I have experience, but yeah, you can take it or leave it. Um, I'd say usually, I don't want to get in trouble. Um, I would say that usually it wouldn't be too difficult to encourage her to attend Orthodox Church with you and learn about Orthodoxy. It depends really how hard set she is. Uh, even if she's really hard set, uh, you know, let's say you marry her, the church will still be like, you'll, they'll make her, if you get married in Orthodox Church, they'll make her take a vow to um, let the ch kids be raised in the Orthodox faith. Um, I don't know if it will, it might cause problems for you. You might be, uh, unequally yoked, but I, I think that you'd be able to red pill her, ortho pill her. I, I don't see how yeah. you couldn't. Well, that's something you're going to have to feel out for yourself. A picture. And I think that person on the right in his profile picture is either his dad or is some someone he looks. At, I don't know. Uh, but if his profile look, picture looks Chad, I think Dan yeah. is definitely bad <laughs> enough to convert her to die. So um, if you if you can't do that, definitely do that. That's definitely something that you can do. And yeah, I mean, and that's a that's a possibility. Uh, I'm not he, I'm not here to tell you. No, don't touch her. You're not allowed to do that. Like that's will be silly. Yeah, of no, me. that's be a, that's a bit. That's me. a bit. It, it's a bit. Yeah, it's a bit silly, isn't it? That's a bit um, crazy. So, so best of luck to you. I hope. I hope it uh, turns out well. Uh, the best I can do is basically support you and give you encouragement because, as I said, I'm a wrong sider in this information divide. I ever had a day. I'm single for nearly 22 years and. I am out here going to become a magician. You guys know once you be a wizard, yeah. When old, you hit you 30, you're a wizard. Yeah, you become a wizard. Yeah. Exactly. I'll, you become a I'll wizard. say I'll say, um, yeah, in in terms of approaching it, I would just say, yeah, just it really depends how intensely, you know, Catholic, how how radical she is, but you should be like, Oh, do you want to come church with me? And then just take her to Litchi. And that's just how you can just start it. Yeah, exactly. You don't uh, need to start bringing issues like, of dogmas or whatever. I don't like, think I like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like, just try, um, try and I'm try and make sure try, try and make it emotionally appealing to her first. I'm sure Dan knows this, but like, obviously, you shouldn't like go like, oh, by the way, don't you know that the it's ecumen. Also, the court to your church is actually rejected by the same pope that affirmed it, like. That will be too confusing for <coughs> stupid female brain. <coughs> uh, but in a good conversation, proper best way to convert someone to orthodoxy in that scenario is introduce them to orthodoxy, really, and let God take the take the reins. 
And once he does that, it's basically my it's gonna it's gonna work fine, definitely. Uh did someone oh I heard some I, I I thought someone broke into my house, but no, not really. <laughs> oh hello Robert. Hey, you wanna rob my house? Yeah, come in here. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, but I think that's the best way to go, obviously. Uh so he's Brazilian as well, yeah. Brazilian Brazilian music is great. Love Brazilian music and Brazilian football players. This is actually he said Brazilian or is the girl Brazilian? I don't know, but he mentioned something about being Brazilian. This I'm a sports sports fan gay. This club in Turkey is notorious for a, in a for a period of time. It was very notorious for having Brazilian foreigners. Like there's like a foreigner rule in football uh, in Turkey. You will have like maximum ten foreigners. That team had. Like, Eight or four were Brazilians. And that's like that's like very bizarre because like just Turkish people connecting with Brazilians is like the most strangest thing that you can imagine, but it actually happened. That's, a, that's one of the funny things that, that like reminded me. Uh but yeah, we hit three hour mark. So are you up yep. to yeah, let's uh let's wrap it up. It? The girl is Brazilian. Yeah. So, oh he's Cuban. All right, Cuban Brazilian. Match made in heaven. So sounds Chad. Yeah, sounds Chad. How do we even close out a podcast? Like, do we just say like, uh, chill me. <laughs> I guess I guess I'll um, close that by saying like and share and tell your friends to love me and subscribe to me and hit the bell. Louis, hit the bell. Do you want to say? Hit, hit the, the bell. bell. That's the most important yeah. thing. It's actually more important than and subscription. <laughs> ironically isn't it? is it yeah um, i guess it is yeah yeah because yeah, then people come back and you get more seo but, um yeah i think that is true. that's what i've heard that's what jay told me anyway um so yeah um thanks for tolerating us talking about random yeah. garbage bunch of st- yeah random garbage and <laughs> I, we got like we got like 20 views <laughs> Consistently, to the views twenty five. Yeah, years, something, something pretty much. That. It's not bad. Which not is bad. okay. I mean, I've seen I've seen other people streams, and some of them are more subscribed to me and get like ten. It's like, damn, dude, I'm sad for you. But twenty, that's yeah. fine. That's okay. Imagine, I imagine I, a I Discord don't, I don't voice think chat. We're, I don't people, think that's a lot. I, I think we're interesting enough that it will take off. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. You leave your you yeah, leave your thoughts in the comments below. Leave your thoughts in the comments below. Leave your comments on these guns. Maybe I don't have I don't have any muscular guns, but I have these guns. So leave your comments and with a prayer. Uh how about how about we end our prayers privately? I don't I don't like doing public prayers. I feel like that's kinda I Yeah, know, I mean I'm not opposed strange. to it in principle, but I don't want to come uh, off as like a like a piety signaler. Like Like I don't have any like I know Sam Shamood does it. Sam yeah. Shamu. Uh, I'm not, we're not saying he's a piety uh, singer. There's nothing wrong does. with doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Like he actually does have piety, but I feel like if yeah. I did it, I felt I I don't yeah. feel like I have enough piety to make it not seem pretentious. And it's just like quirk. But you, know, you can always pray, uh, and we will probably do. I'm not. I'm gonna keep it a secret, but you can always do it private. So let's end it. Yeah, here. we're we're gonna uh, follow Jesus in a sense where he says, "Pray and you know, pray in your." closet basically so private room pray in your heart yeah. yep again so, there's nothing wrong with doing it publicly but yeah exactly yeah i'm just i'm just two weeks to do it uh yeah same so thank you all for watching this uh when do you think lewis we can do part two uh any like if someone asked us when do you think we could episode two i really love this i want to see episode two <laughs> i don't know uh saturday nights know. whenever i feel like it. <laughs> uh tomorrow it can be tomorrow it can be from five <laughs> hours it can be next we month. we should no, I'm... that's mystery <laughs> yeah uh close I'm the thinking... series by spinning a football <laughs> i'm gonna close it by mr <laughs> mr uh <laughs> Man, I had Mr. Water, right? Mr. Water was like the mascot in my live streams. Now he's gone because we had a breakup. But uh, now it's like 
I don't know, like Mr. Uh, what's this? Uh, candy bar? No, it's not a candy bar. So I can't have an inanimate friend. But wait, 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 I, I, I need to. I need to go. Base and J, shout out to Boy J. Base J. <laughs> Shout out to our boy yeah, don't, don't worry, Irish Sailor. Jay, this will all be uploaded onto the channel as soon as we're done. Um, yeah, Irish, this will be up to the channel. So if you want all, you can basically, I don't know, like just listen and do something else while we're subscribe, talking. Subscri subscribe, subscribe uh, to YouTube Premium, and then you can listen to it as audio. That's what I've done. I've exactly. quit Jay's Spotify. Start so, so knowing that, uh, like, if we stream and Jay streams, you know, Jay's not gonna get many views because we're so popular. Yeah, uh, we are. Yeah, <laughs> he'll lose so, all twenty of these uh, views we've got. Exactly. Yes. So we have closed it here. Thank you for watching, guys. I'll see you guys in the next stream or video. Goodbye, and God be with you all. See you Goodbye. guys. God bless. And broadcast clip.